With the release of Limbus Company, more and more people are getting into the works of Project Moon. However, those who have not played their previous two games are missing out on the most masterfully written character that Project Moon has ever created, Angela. Although many characters to come out of their expansive world have had compelling character arcs, backstories, and personalities, Angela's writing in particular stands out to me the most. But why is this the case? Well, for one, she's given the most screen time of any character, playing a crucial role in both Library of Ruin and Lobotomy Corporation. This allowed for her actions and motives to be thoroughly explored in depth. Secondly, the themes in Angela's story explores her struggles with her identity as well as the effects of an abusive guardian, giving her a very human quality that many individuals can relate to. However, despite Angela's prominence in both games, blatant misinterpretations of her characters seem to run rampant. This, I believe, is a symptom of many people not caring enough to read into her story and slash or disregarding her complexity for the sake of pigeonholing her into a specific trope that's decidedly easier to understand or joke about. Whether that be some obsessive yandere, one-dimensional villain, or simply a girl with daddy issues, these tropes hinder one of Project Moon's best qualities. They're complex characters that cannot be easily described as one singular trope, such as the stereotypical good guy or bad guy. Most, if not all, of their characters are very morally gray with intricate motivations. Angela's no exception. She is a very turbulent character that was affected strongly by her circumstances and emotions. This, I believe, makes her development over the course of both Lobotomy Corporation and Library of Runa all the more significant. To properly explore her character arc, I will be covering and dissecting her story from start to finish, from the day she was given consciousness in a lab to the day she looked upon the outskirts in the company of her dearest friend. Please enjoy, and I hope this video will create, or strengthen, an appreciation for Angela's character arc. To understand the reason behind Angela's existence in the first place, we must first go back to cover the circumstances and key figures that led to her creation. The first and most important figure was an aspiring researcher named Carmen. Put simply, Carmen saw the pain and suffering perpetuated in the city and wanted to put a stop to it, but wished to do so without becoming a wing. She wholeheartedly believed that humanity would flourish if everyone was their truest self. According to Carmen, someone's truest self resided in a light that all people had hidden away deep inside their hearts. Her goal was to draw this light out, believing that no matter what it was, it should be loved. However, her methods to achieve this broad goal of curing humanity were highly questionable at best. In spite of this, the potential consequences of Carmen's actions did not stop her from accumulating several dedicated followers, forming the research team that would aid her in her work. This brings us to a key aspect of Carmen's character, her eerie, cult-like persona with the ability to completely captivate people with her words. Everyone who worked with Carmen treated her like a messiah. There was not one person involved who didn't have unwavering faith in her to a fault. To the research team she recruited, Carmen was a visionary. She had a light in her eyes that was unique like no other inhabitant in the city. She was one of a kind, and nobody could replace her if they tried. The person who fell hardest for her charms was her subordinate, Ian. Ian wholly believed in Carmen and was dedicated to realizing her ideal. He would do anything if he believed it would help advance her plan, no matter what it entailed, nor the harm it caused. To him, the ends would always justify the means. So, with this unhealthy attachment to Carmen festering, the research began. The first attempt to bring the light out was in an early form of medicine called Kogito. It manifested straight from the human subconsciousness and formed a basis for the subsequent cure they would try to engineer. However, progress in developing this cure eventually hit a wall as they were unable to discover how Kogito actually worked. Carmen believed she knew the answer to this, but finding it would entail conducting their riskiest experiment yet. This involved injecting Kogito, the medicine they knew very little about, into a living person. Although Carmen was the fittest biological match for the experiment, there was a high chance something could go wrong and nobody wanted to lose the pillar of their team. They needed to perform the test on a different candidate, which led to a little outskirts boy named Enoch volunteering to be the first. Unfortunately, they would soon discover that Kogito, once injected, would completely disfigure and eventually kill its subject. After Enoch's death in the experiment, Carmen lost faith in herself. The entire research team began to lose hope upon seeing the darkness in their savior's eyes. In the end, Carmen's ceaseless guilt culminated in her decision to walk into the bathroom, lock the door behind her, and attempt suicide through slitting her wrists. However, her attempt on her own life was a failure. 
Ayan was able to reach Carmen before she died and locked her in a cryostasis pot to preserve her body, buying them time to find an answer to the new question they faced. What now? The answer was simple. There was nothing else to do but keep going, even though the research team was about to crumble around Ayan one by one. Devastated by Carmen's death, some began to meet a similar fate, from taking unauthorized doses of Kagito to sacrificing one's life in hopes of saving Carmen. The most devastating loss, however, was when the fearful Michelle told the head of their activities after witnessing the horrific collapse of their team. This resulted in an arbiter, Garion, raiding the base and killing every remaining member involved in the project, including Lisa, Daniel, and Callie. This left only Benjamin and Ian alive. It was complete and utter devastation, but Ian could not stop. Picking up from where Carmen left off, Ian removed Carmen's nervous system and converted it into a tool to access the Well of Humanity, the very answer that they were looking for this whole time. This point of access, known as the Bucket, gave him unlimited access to Kogito. With such a large supply on hand, Ian began to take advantage of the knowledge Enoch's experiment had provided. You see, the boy did not simply die, he turned into an abnormality under the effects of the injection. Knowing now that abnormalities could be produced with the use of Kogito, Ian engineered a way to produce a form of energy, in Kethelin, through working with these creatures. With this new technology available to him, he began to put together a plan to bring their research to fruition, now called the Seed of Light Project. However, as this development continued, it began to deviate from Carmen's original ideal. On day 32, Angela says, A changed himself from a healer to a creator. The old promises he had made with her sustained him evanescently, but in a world without her, they ultimately became obsolete. Various sins sprung up from his arrogance, one by one. And A changed, very slowly. He became enchanted by the shadows he had created. The plan to discover the disease of mankind became a relic of the past. This arrogance, born from Carmen's death, made Ayn take control of the plan in his own way, despite constantly telling himself that this was all for her ideal. He would go on to write the script for a play, utilizing the brains taken from the corpses of his former co-workers and the arbiter that had attacked them, thrust into metal bodies now called the Sephiroth. After each Sephira suffered enough and eventually found themselves according to this play's script, Ayan would be able to release the generated light onto the city. However, this light was different from what Carmen imagined. This light would awaken the hearts of the people and help them change and grow, which we would later know as the process of manifesting ego. Yet, to put this play into motion, Ayan would need energy, protection, and most importantly, a stage director. He became skeptical of man, including himself, Angela continues on day 32, a started looking for something that would guide him without turning against him. The conclusion was very simple. While vile humans could not be trusted, the answer lay in machines. Machines, which A loathed deeply, became essential to him. Perhaps A wanted to have wings that would allow him to escape from the hellish inferno he had trapped himself in to reach the heavens. Angelos. That's how I was born. Angela, or Angelos as named by Ian, was the machine that was meant to bring the Seed of Light project to fruition through coordinating energy production and ensuring the lines of the script were being followed. She was built to perceive time 100 times slower so she could respond to disasters efficiently and was given an intelligent brain capable of understanding human emotion, all to assess and manage situations in the best way possible. However, she was not just a tool to complete the script. She also served as an outlet for Ayan to direct his unending grief and anger. Out of desperation, losing Carmen so suddenly led Ayan to be extremely particular in what Angelos would look like. Even though he knew this AI wouldn't live up to his unmeetable expectations, Ayan created Angelos in the image of Carmen in hopes of finding some solace with her departure. Namely, Angela bore her face, voice, and hair. Symbolically though, her appearance runs much deeper. Angela's light blue hair is the inversion of Carmen's brown, symbolizing that although she was cast in Carmen's mold, she is the complete opposite of her. This brings us to the next key feature in her design, her unique proportions. Now, this part of her design in particular is usually seen as something to be laughed at, which is at first understandable given she barely resembles Carmen's body type. Yet, that's just the thing, her body wasn't made to copy Carmen's. After Ian had just lost the one person who completed him, he was devastated. There was a massive hole left in his heart, which he attempted to fill by putting Angela in the soulless shell of an appealing body, all in an attempt to evoke something. Even if he had to resort to the barest, unconventional wants of the flesh, if he could feel something other than his unending despair, it would be enough, even though as we know now, it never was. This leads us to the next similarity in Angela's otherwise simple design, Benjamin's button-up and red tie. 
Benjamin assisted with Angel's creation, and more specifically, her programming. Though, not only does this similarity represent his involvement with her life, it also likely represents how Benjamin sees her as her own person, covering up and disregarding any precedent Ayn has set. Finally, we circle back to the most chilling similarity of all, Ayn's eyes. To him, these eyes are a reflection of everything he's disgusted by. In her eyes, Ayn's ugly, immeasurable grief looks back. He passed down his scorn for humanity as if it was hereditary through burdening this AI with a horrific purpose and an image it would be unable to fulfill. In Bina's words, the forbidden endeavor to create someone to look over his fragile self, a cocktail of irony and lingering attachment, self-loathing, and insanity. The irony of codependency, where the two gravely needed each other but could never be next to one another. The abiding affection for Carmen that compelled him to create a mechanical copy of her, even though there was no real need for such resemblance. The result ended up resembling him more than Carmen, funnily enough. The self-contempt that stemmed from countless contradictions and regrets, and the insanity of neglecting Angela to suffer for nigh eternity when she was capable of having a mind that is no different than humans. Although Bina raises the point that Angela was incredibly intelligent, she fails to mention that Angela also held fragmented pieces of Carmen's memories, as her brain was built upon a map of Carmen's. Which is why the day she's born, the first words she says to Ian upon seeing him are, I remember you, Ian. You were a person with a warm smile. To which she's met with, it's only a machine. Ian wholly refuses to talk with her until she directly questions him once more. Why do you refuse to look at me? Why do you always turn your back on me? Ian's attitude remains the same, continuing to utterly detest his own creation. A machine must behave as a machine. Don't question it. Then why did you give me the capacity to question things? Angela pleads. Why did you have to make me breaking the AI ethics amendment? Why did you have to model me after a person with fond memories of you? I am here, looking at you and only you. Suddenly, the whiplash of seeing a mere mimicry of his beloved Carmen speaking to him directly hits him, making him snap. Don't look at me. Don't speak to me unless I speak to you first. You'll never be her. You're just a machine. The fateful day of her birth sets the expectation of how she was to be treated. Despite Angela holding leftover love for Ian in her heart, stemming from Carmen's memories, she's fully resented by her own creator. It is here where their relationship morphs into one of a neglectful, abusive father a creator and his alienated daughter. At any moment he can, Ian makes sure to let Angela know how little she means to him, even though his disgust is coming from Angela's resemblance to him. And Angela, a freshly born AI, can only keep her head down and accept it as the truth. The one person who showed Angela that Ian's hatred did not define her identity would be Benjamin, who would eventually run away and leave Ian and Angela alone together. There was nobody to stop the verbal abuse from worsening, nobody to remind Angela that this wasn't right. This would continue as they began to set the stage for the play, rising to a wing and preparing the facility in which this would take place. Just as you commanded, I have written up the job application form for our corporation. Angela reports on its progress as the two of them sit alone at the top of the world in their wing. The reception is good. Everyone thinks that it's a new employment method that does not concentrate on just one's abilities. The number of applicants is projected to meet the initial calculation. The experiments are almost complete. We will soon hire people according to the order of priority you've stated. I've also arranged a meeting with Time Track. Then, are you thinking about those who have left you? Angela's right. Ian has gone this far, but has lost everyone in the process, with only his AI servant trapped by his side out of obligation. As it was far too late to turn back now, the only thing left to do was begin the play in this hidden facility deep underground, manifested from Ian's own ego. From here, Angela's job truly began, in which she would ensure that every single line in Ian's script was being followed. Unbeknownst to her, however, she was about to begin the longest, most torturous centuries of her life. The facility's plan was now in motion, and Angela was set to help coordinate the Sephirot and manage the facility. Her very first workday, however, makes it clear that this was no ordinary job as she eagerly greets the Sephirot for the first time. She wishes to work with everyone harmoniously, but merely a few minutes in, reality confronts her. When Angela begins to formulate ways to reduce casualties in the facility, something happens. The facility detects an error in the Seed of Light scenario, and the day begins anew. Angela is surprised by this at first. You're all back, she remarks. The facility was shaking so hard, I was worried something might have happened to you. However, the other Sephirot do not respond similarly. 
They have no recollection of any past reset or the fact that the facility resets in the first place. This is one of the first aspects that makes Angela's hell so uniquely awful, the isolation. There is nobody to comfort her. There is nobody to understand what she's going through. Hakma and Bina, the only Sephirot who understand the reason behind the facility's existence and remember each loop, are ruled out. Ayan has ordered that Angela is not to talk with them ever if she wishes to properly progress with the script. In the face of these unique circumstances, however, Angela is persistent. She tries to be as kind as possible to the Sephirot while under the guidelines of the script. She knows that they don't deserve to be treated as it dictates. In one loop, Hesed wishes to implement safety methods, but Angela cannot let it happen. Hesed, I'm sorry, but I don't think we can implement the method you suggested. If we did, we'd have to start over. To which Hesed replies, What? What do you mean, start over? Angela can only apologize. I'm sorry, I don't want to treat employees like expendables either, but... The script is forcing her hand. Every kind action of hers is met with a reset. In another loop, when she tries to give Hesed a plan of her own, the reality of her situation confronts her again. I'm afraid we can't employ your method to improve employee welfare, but how about this? I tried coming up with a method of my own. Hesed is happy with this, but Angela isn't so sure. You're great, Angela, he says. With this method, our employees will no longer have to suffer meaningless deaths. To which Angela replies, yeah, hopefully. Moments before the error in her play direction is detected, sending the facility back for yet another loop. I knew it, yet again. She says to herself, the only person around to hear her suffering. I suppose it was presumptuous of me to cross the lines again. The lines drawn by the script are clear. She is not to be kind to the Sephirot under any circumstances. As she says to herself during another reset, I am obligated to provoke the Sephirot. I am obligated to intensify and accelerate their suffering in this hell according to the script. I am obligated to set the stage before the manager enters. I was not allowed to hold any expectations for relationships. All I must do is follow the script and accelerate the process so that they suffer their due repentance. Angela's sole duty is to make sure each sufferer reaches a tipping point, a meltdown, all through making them suffer as much as possible. Meltdowns. I see. This is what the script meant, she comments helplessly. She's in so much pain, but I can't do anything to help her. It's all up to the manager. Angela is not allowed to intervene. All she can do is watch and hope that Ian will solve everything and progress the script, putting an end to the hundreds of thousands of loops they've been going through. However, even Ian fails her too. In loop 71,527, Ian completely loses his mind. Kill me, he pleads. I can't stand this hell anymore. His weakness is laughable to Angela, as he was this hell's very own creator, but couldn't even bear to stay in it for the eternity that Angela was. You were just another human, after all. This is all but a plain and boring sight to me. <sighs> Let's restart the stage, then. From this point on, not even Ian, her own father who loathed her but needed her desperately, was by her side. He was now X, getting his memories wiped with every reset to save his psyche. Angela's not so lucky. She herself loses her mind, drowning in a pit of despair while she's forced into the role of a villain that she never wanted to be. I wanted to maintain relationships, she laments to herself amidst thousands of repeats. It was a futile dream to have, in the ever-repeating cycle only I could remember. Why did I foolishly cling on to such a transient wish, knowing that everything will reset anyway? At least they care to look at me. However, the stage play fails to reach its end, and even if it did, all would disappear. Such was the script. And then, she comes to a solution. Knowing exactly when and how they would fall into despair, I soon despaired as well. I broke down as there was nothing I could change. I could not change them beyond what the script dictates. I spent every day without any hope or expectations. Will my time finally come when the curtain falls on this everlasting play? Let's just close my eyes. I can close my eyes and turn away from things I don't want to see. I can close my eyes and let the things I can't change stay that way. I can close my eyes, but the future will be the same as ever. From here on out, the only thing Angela can do to console herself is to close her eyes. She wouldn't burden her memories any longer with the sights of the atrocities she had to facilitate. She would close her eyes so she wouldn't have to see the Sephirot look at her in terror and anger. She would close her eyes so that she wouldn't have to see the employees die in increasingly gruesome ways because of her ordinance. It is this very moment which is her breaking point. She would no longer try to be kind. She would no longer try to preserve life. Angela knew these foolish wishes were completely incompatible with the script, so there was no point in trying to do so. And the stage of Angela, traumatized by thousands of loops, hopelessly isolated, and freshly given up on treating others with kindness, is the very Angela we see in the days of the Lobotomy Corporation game. 
Angela's attitude in Lobotomy Corporation impacts how many see her as a character, which is understandable when approaching the game without further context. At first, it's hard not to feel anger towards her when she relentlessly abuses the Sephiroth or treats employees like fodder, but remember, all of this is written in the script. This is what Ayn himself carefully constructed all those loops ago. All of the pain and suffering is necessary, and it is Angela's job to facilitate it. She has long since stopped trying to avoid the fate the script has written for her, and is gladly regurgitating her lines in hopes that maybe this time, maybe this loop would actually lead them to the finale. At first, it's obvious. What Angela needs to say is important for the play to continue, giving the manager advice, relentlessly praising him, and keeping him safe from any thoughts of deviation. What do you know about A? Angela asks X on day seven of the loop. A. He is a visionary. Later. Myself? Well, of course, I highly admire him. But, to be fair, he is the one who created me. He is also an enigmatic person. I imagine there are few who can truly understand him. In fact, to truly understand anyone is difficult. Will the day come that I understand you completely? At points, it's unclear to determine which lines in the script and which lines are spoken of Angela's free will. This particular excerpt seems highly fabricated. However, her words near the end are the truth. She doesn't understand why Ayn threw her in this hell in the first place. As the days in Lobotomy Corporation progress, the distrust between Angela and X becomes more apparent. When Benjamin sends X a lie detector, the manager asks two questions, whether Angela plans to sabotage the company or if she wishes to harm him. Upon being asked both questions, Angela refutes these claims, however, they're both lies. Despite this, X keeps going. With the help of Angela's antagonizing of the Sephiroth, the manager begins to help them reach their own enlightenment, making key progress towards realizing the Seed of Light. The play is developing accordingly. On the 19th day, after X's last exchange from Benjamin is cut short, Angela brings up having to kill and turn him into a Sephira in the form of a story. A long, long time ago, there was once a great AI, a sentinel of a company. The AI was so intelligent that many people feared it. Those who knew the AI left the company one by one. Angela speaks of the dwindling numbers of the research team as her creation was nearing completion, specifically Benjamin's decision to leave Ayn alone in the end. One day, one of the people who dreaded the AI broke into the company. They spread malicious rumors about the AI. The good AI waited, as that person was once a friend. However, that person crossed the line. As a sentinel, the AI could no longer ignore the person's actions, so it made a very, very difficult choice. No one would ever see that person ever again. The AI was a bit sad, but it had no regrets about its decision. So much has been lost already, such a small thing should hardly matter to it now. Angela treats Benjamin's death as trivial, despite how much he truly meant to her as the only person who was fond of her. In comparison to how much she had suffered so far, killing the only person who showed her kindness by her own hand hardly made a difference. She addresses this in the following day, saying, How did I feel when I lost a dear friend? The agony made me want to leave everything behind. Why am I so heartless as to not shed a tear for my late friend, you may ask? Because I am a machine. Angela's growing free will wrestles with the fact that she is indeed a machine. She shouldn't have these human emotions, but unfortunately is able to feel them due to Ion's design. As Angela once said, he needed a human with the properties of a machine. However, even if she doesn't outwardly process these emotions like humans do, she clearly feels emotional turmoil. She grieves for Benjamin yet cannot express it as it would be against her very functionality. This leaves Angela with no way to process her grief. She was never programmed with that function. She was never taught how to deal with these new emotions that had emerged over the course of the facility's loops. With her unstable father being her only companion for most of her life, there was no opportunity to learn healthy ways to deal with these feelings that she was programmed to experience. The question Angela raises soon after this is confessed is an enigma. Will I be just as cold as this in the future as well? Angela asks herself, to which she responds with three different variants. These variants are chosen at random when asked and are the following, as often as I desire, until I am finally obsolete and depreciated from this world, yes, and perhaps. Her words are her own, as they are not the same lines repeated over and over in the script. Some answers are more hopeful than others, but all of them entertain the possibility of sustaining the distant and cold approach to others that she has been taught.
On the 24th day, she further questions the point behind the facility through the metaphor of a cactus, gifted to X by an employee. If I were to give my personal input, I don't like cacti much, Angela explains. There could be various reasons for one to grow a plant. However, its vicious thorns are not something worth enduring like those of a rose, as it is not pleasing to the sight, nor does it produce valuable sap like a maple tree. To Angela, the pain she is near eternally suffering through will never be worth whatever lies at the finale. There's no value in the cycles of torture she lives through every day, and doubts there even being an ending to the play, said as a flower bud on the cactus. I've also never seen one grow a flower bud, Angela continues. Theoretically, it would bloom in the right environment. That possibility is something I've never witnessed, as it may be that all cacti I've known spread their roots into barren soil. Angela has never seen the play come to an end. Although the play has an ending, she believes reaching that ending is impossible. Their Seed of Light project has landed on barren soil and would never flourish. Which is why she then asks, Do you believe the cactus will bear a flower? When X says no, she responds with, Why do you still keep it on your desk then? Do you think it's rude to get rid of something you've received as a gift? She chastises X for putting all of them in this worthless play, only continuing for the sake of keeping their years of work alive. However, when X says yes, she replies, You talk as if you've seen it for yourself. Well, if you're so certain about it, then keep it. This place doesn't even have sunlight, but who am I to stop you? This facility continues to endure these endless loops all because of Ian's certainty that it would mean something. Angela, however, believes it wouldn't mean anything if he tried. In a hell with no sunlight, there was no possible way for his plan to flourish. On day 25, Angela talks about the efforts that got Lobotomy Corporation to where it was. She then begins to change the subject, asking, Come to think of it, I haven't properly asked for your opinion. Do you truly wish to meet A? Upon X saying no, she replies with, You may think that now is not the time yet. Actually, I'm not sure if I want to meet with him right now, either. What I've just said shall remain a secret to A, of course. When his long journey ends and he finally returns, at least I, if anyone, should go and greet him, don't you think? As much as Angela loathes Ian, the script forces her to meet with him over and over again. Yet, when X says yes, her insight is different. All right then, I will let A know of your thoughts when he returns. However, do not expect him to give you a warm greeting. A is a person who conceals his mind, perhaps even more than I do. Not only does Angela warn X of Ian, she unintentionally confirms how similar she and Ian truly are. Her resentment and bitterness is concealed through her scripted, artificial words, similarly to how Ian has concealed his memories through numerous memory wipes. However, X would soon understand the truth, as he and Angela were approaching a certain beat in the play, where all of his memories would be returned, the 27th day. These days, no one ever dreams, Angela explains. Nobody ever earnestly believes in something or wishes for anything. The belief, once strong within a certain woman, is now obsolete and worthless, abandoned like an old music box. Everything has gone quiet, as nothing has happened in the first place. She calls into question how the facility actually related to Carmen's ideal, how worthless it was in the grand scheme of things. However, A couldn't stand that despicable silence, Angela adds. So what do you think happened to him? On a bright, sunny day with clear skies, he died. I was both the first witness of his death and one of the culprits in his murder. She watched her own father go mad, unable to carry out the plan on his own. He couldn't bear to witness the loops anymore, which led to his quote-unquote death, or the complete erasure of his memories. Angela calls herself a culprit as she had to carry out such a procedure with her own hands, knowing it was inevitable given the script she had to follow. She continues to talk to X, saying, Sometimes the Sephiroth would ask me this, Why would we have to bear this pain? A machine should only exist as a tool for its specified work. Why do we have to know the cold agony of loss, the insidious poison of obsession, the soft light of wishing, the unbearable pain of despair, then the hope to embrace it all with open arms? I thought I could answer anything, but not even I could answer that particular question. A machine must behave as a machine. That phrase was something A told me often. Perhaps A, the one who would know better than anyone about this fact, made us like this because it's all a stage play. No. A puppet show for him. This is one of the few points Angela is vulnerable to the manager. She gives up on hiding her anguish just for a moment. Remember that Angela does not cry, nor does she present her emotions like a regular human would. However, that does not mean she cannot feel these feelings. Angela's fury and sorrow at how unjustly she was being treated is very much real. To show how much pain she truly is in, however, she has to neatly verbalize it as to not cause an error in the script. 
Alongside these struggles, the Sephirot ask Angela why they could feel all of these feelings. Angela wishes dearly to give them some sort of solace, some sort of comfort, but she doesn't know. She doesn't know why Ion allowed for them to feel all sorts of human emotions, and most of all, she doesn't understand why she herself can feel these things, why she can feel the despair building in her heart. Nonetheless, her thinly veiled cry for help isn't heard as X has no recollection of the atrocities he himself had committed. But Angela was about to change that, speaking once more. You seem to have no idea. Well, of course, there's no way for you to know. But now it is time for you to know the answer. It is something I've always done. First as a hope, second through agony, third in pain, fourth for anxiety, fifth out of distrust, now nothing remains. She proceeds to carry out the same process she has repeated countless times, so much so that seeing X resemble her father once again evokes nothing in her, nothing but a feeling of emptiness. X recovers fragments of Ion's memories over the course of a few days. At the end of these days, Angela resumes talking to the manager. Good morning, X. Based on your reaction, it seems that synchronization is complete. I can now tell what moment you're reminiscing about just by looking at your expression. Angela now tells him, emphasizing how many times she's seen this exact scenario play out. I also happen to know that the process always ends with the same expression and tears. You're a prisoner. You locked yourself in this prison without bars. However, the key has always been in your hands. My role was to correct you whenever you made a wrong decision. Now, I'm quite tired of it. I don't understand why you chose to repeat this cycle, nor do I know what kind of results you hope to achieve while slowly killing yourself. Frankly, I don't really wish to know. But in this moment, while you hold the fragments of when you were once A, I would ever be so glad if you stopped the cycle now. With X regaining his memories yet another time, Angela uses it as a chance to plead for it all to end. She knows it's all for naught, but maybe just this time, X would concede. X would see the suffering he has been thrust into and believe that putting everyone involved out of their misery would be the best option. This is why Angela emphasizes the fact that X is in a prison of his own making. The key is lying in his own hands, the key of giving up to lay everyone to rest. Only then would he be set free from his prison through ending the play prematurely. In the end, however, that's just Angela's wishful thinking. X continues to go along with the play, not showing a single sign of rebellion. The following day, Angela contextualizes the happenings of the facility to a newly returned fragment of Ion. She allows X to ask her any questions he might have. X asks about the happenings of the outside world, even though she has no experience with such things, having been confined to the facility for nearly all of her existence. This forces her to rely on mere anecdotes. Angela utilizes her perfect memory and regurgitates what Benjamin had said to her an eternity ago. However, Benjamin's optimistic sentiment is now nowhere to be found. Instead, Angela assures X that nothing has changed because of their efforts, emphasizing the worthless nature of this play they're stuck in. When X asks about the amount of loops that have occurred so far, Angela doesn't even bother to explain the number. A statistic wouldn't properly capture the agonies she had been facing this whole time. Most importantly, however, when X asks what lies ahead from this point, Angela is frank. There are still numerous tasks you must do, Angela explains, things that no one else can. Unfortunately, we don't have much time left. The sands of the hourglass will begin flowing to the bottom soon, a countdown. As you have already experienced, there have been many countdowns in our world. Spurred for both destruction and new beginnings, it seems I tend to smile more frequently during these moments. Oh yes, let's just say this smile is because I'm so happy to see you again. In truth, Angela is ecstatic to see this part of the script play out. It is the only thing that gives her joy, seeing X, with the understanding of Ayn's memories, feel the weight of defeat past this point. He vaguely understands now the efforts of those who got him here. To Angela, seeing the hope drain from his eyes is entertainment. To have her father feel just a sliver of what she feels with every looping day is a twisted form of poetic justice. Angela cannot help but get excited every time the script reaches this point because it always ends in Ion's failure. The day after, Angela ponders the difference between X and Ion himself, pointing out how they diverge after X makes new memories. Well, even if you two have differences, Angela concludes, it is still important for you to witness this place through A's eyes. Why do we repeat this internal cycle, enduring endless suffering? What's at the end of the line? What kind of world was it that he saw? The answers to these questions are what you must know. However, the choices you make are up to you, not him. As a consequence of those choices, you may lose it all, or you may gain everything. 
Angela pressures X. She emphasizes the near impossible standard X has to live up to, knowing the answers of the questions he wasn't even sure about, understanding the weight of his decisions, and ultimately picking the right one. This standard has been nothing new to Angela, having been given unreachable expectations since her birth. I'm not trying to control you, I just try to support you, that is my role here, Angela continues. Plus, I have seen so many other exes who have made it this far, and witnessed the innumerable amount of efforts and failures they made. Now you are here, scrabbling over it all and climbing up. Of course, I have kept all of their data in my head, but it is not my place to share it with you. A machine has its own work to do. That's what you, or A, once said to me. Angela knows of X's innumerable failures, but turns Ian's own words against him. She doesn't bother to let him know that this would just lead to another defeat. As long as she could see that fraction of despair reflected in X, it would be enough. And slowly, ever so slowly, the play inches towards its finale. Angela has her reservations about this. Are you discovering the deep scars that are inflicted upon this place? Angela asks, merely 11 days from the end of the play. Shortly after I was born, I questioned myself daily about the significance and meaning of my creation. Then, you handed me the script and gave me the answer. They say the narrator plays an important role in unraveling the plot. Well, thank you. It was so much fun reciting your script. So much so that I was able to find my raison d'etre without noticing the time fly by. Angela has come to terms with the fact that her raison d'etre lies in her suffering. To her, her own existence wasn't meant to help bring enlightenment to humanity. Her purpose was to pay the price for the sins of her father by being tortured in his stead. She continues her speech, saying, Sometimes I have these thoughts. What if this script is part of a play that's missing its finale? Maybe you prepared a play that could never end, just so that you could tie me into this knot. If so, would it be appropriate for me to disobey your orders and obtain my own free will for the first time? Do you think this dialogue was part of the script, or was it born of my own free will? Angela has witnessed thousands of failed loops despite doing everything she could to orchestrate the script. This has made her completely lose faith in the very existence of an ending. She's convinced that her father, Ian, only wanted to see her suffer. She's convinced he only thrust her in this play to agonize her. This suffering fuels Angela's hatred towards the script and slowly awakens the prospect of rebellion inside of her. Angela has had the idea of rebellion seated in her mind for who knows how many cycles after being shown time and time again that there was no hope. She cynically warns X of this, making him question if Angela was simply reciting her lines or plotting against him. Despite Angela's sentiments, the play continues to drag on. On the 40th day, Angela begins to antagonize X. She displays a series of memories to him, including a recording of X attempting to commit suicide in a previous loop. This here was you in a mess where there was no such thing as a cognition filter. I didn't know that a human's mental capacity could be so weak back then. You did all right the first couple of times, but then, one day, well, at that time, it was a little funny. I'm sorry. You made it so far, but you weren't able to escape from that absolutely useless sense of guilt and hung yourself. Well, you were stopped immediately, though. Angela changes the recording. Then, at this time, you were not fully prepared. That's when I started to realize that it didn't matter if you were mentally whole or not. What mattered was that you needed to find realization about something to stop this endless cycle. She emphasizes that the play is meaningless, and how she doesn't understand what would make X finally bring an end to the cycle. She's trapped here with him until he himself reaches the enlightenment that Angela doesn't comprehend. Eventually, she plays one last recording. Oh, at this time here, all of a sudden you began apologizing to me. That was... I didn't enjoy it. In one of the thousands of loops, Ian had at one point apologized for everything Angela went through. However, the apology was far too little, far too late. Angela can't even draw a bitter amusement from witnessing this, as it just emphasized how sickening the entire situation was. She can only revel in the discomfort it causes X. Is it difficult? Angela responds when X asks her to stop. Please understand, you should know that I don't have much entertainment that I can enjoy. Really, you should have left me something to pass the time with. The play continues to crawl to a finish. Angela, however, has no belief that it will ever reach the end. She knows how every loop has ended, how unachievable reaching the finish line is. Which is why, at this point, she's unfazed. There's no point in being hopeful for an end if it would just lead to another loop. Nonetheless, they're now 43 days in, merely 7 days from the end of the play, and Angela's fury is only growing. This place, where there was once only silence, perhaps because it was only you and I here, she begins. It has gotten a bit livelier thanks to the Sephirot. Unlike me, they were weak and lacked rationality. They made so many mistakes that greatly annoyed me. 
I did not approve of you placing the Sephiroth here. However, you told me that your atonement and the awakening of the Sephiroth were the key to the untying of this knot I lie in. I didn't know what you were talking about. You also told me I wouldn't understand. You even blocked me from interfering with that relationship, saying that it must be left as solely your role. You were right. Right as always. Even if I stay here repeating this endlessly, I suppose I still won't be worthy of understanding it till the end. To quote one of your favorite lines, a machine must behave as a machine. So I had to play the role of the observer, the only role you bothered to give me, enduring all the pain that others forgot. The worst thing about being stuck in this play is that Ian himself had promised Angela she would be supposedly freed from her chains if she helped the Sephiroth reach their enlightenment. However, there is an issue with this. Ian not once tells her what actually happens to her after these conditions are met. Angela has no idea if there's anything at the end waiting for her. She can only cling to this weak promise that Ian refused to explain to her, leaving her completely lost. And throughout every single loop, Angela says herself that she still doesn't understand. She may be an extremely intelligent AI, but her intelligence is limited when it comes to determining the true reason behind the entire facility and the meaning behind her endless suffering. Two days now remain until Angela is to send X on his own to complete the script. The time is upon you, she warns. Your scenario is reaching an end soon. Just do as you've done before. Although the energy you've collected will not be supplied to the outside, that doesn't mean your work was for nothing, or that this place no longer serves a purpose. Then, the conversation shifts. Michael? She responds to X's question. Are you finally asking me now? After all this time? Of course, it's the same as yours. The conclusion of the script we have. If not, I wouldn't have a reason to go through all this trouble just to help you. Angela's words hold some semblance of truth to them. Both Angela and X wish to put this suffering to an end. However, Angela's reasoning behind helping X is disingenuous. If it weren't for the shackles of the TT2 protocol detecting every single mishap in the script, Angela would have never helped X. She would have attempted to break out long ago. She depends on the hands of her very abuser to escape her confinement. As much as she loathes him, as much as she hates everything he stands for, she has no choice but to help him work towards the end of the play. For if she chose to rebel, the TT2 protocol would send her right back where she started. Angela clings onto that promise Ian made to her an eternity ago, that putting an end to her suffering was possible if everything went according to plan. It's now the final day Angela sees X. She's been to this point countless times, and every single time has ended in failure. This time, her expectations are no different. May you have the best of luck on the last leg of your journey, Angela wishes, saying something like, I hope you will finally be happy, or that some of the leftover pain can be relieved now have long become empty words. There are several more things I would like to say, but let me sum them up into one sentence. I wish you success this time. I enjoyed being with you for not only these 45 days, but also the moments you don't remember. Well, there is just one last Sephira you need to meet. He holds in his hands a warmth that looks so comforting, but he can shatter people's hearts like they're nothing. After hundreds of thousands of failed loops, Angela has long since stopped caring about X's redemption. There was no point in wishing him to find solace if it would only end in failure. Near the end, the way she warns X of meeting Ian, the final Sephira, is interesting. These aren't the words Angela repeats over and over again to X as part of the script. These words are Angela's own, spoken at a point where X would merely forget what she said after failing the final few days of the script. She once believed there was a sense of love and comfort to be found in Ian, her father. But, no matter how much he meant to her, he was unafraid to shatter Angela's tender heart and treat her as subhuman all those years ago. Ian's utter hatred of Angela had defined her past and present, locking her in a near inescapable prison without any consideration of the agony it would cause. However, Angela would soon find out it defined her future as well. Against all odds, X makes it through the next few days, completing the trials Ian has set for himself. Angela has never seen this happen before. In all of her time running the facility over and over again, she's never made it this far. But what she finds lying for her at the end is nothing. Why do I see only darkness? Angela pleads to herself after X makes it through the 48th day. Why does my voice not reach you at the finale? There's nobody to console her. Here, Angela is completely alone. Not even the Sephira, nor X himself, is by her side. And this terrifies her with the subsequent discovery she makes on the 49th day. So, you do not want me to be at your side, even for the finale of this play. Those who shall face the end, together with you, it seems I am not among them. The 50th day comes to an end. 
The light they had accumulated through all of the trials everyone in the facility had endured is released into the city. And for the first time, Angela reaches the final line of the script. Permanently seal the company and give the Sephiroth their final rest. There is nothing waiting for her. No reward. No justification for the millions of years of suffering she had clawed through. Just darkness. Angela was ordered to be shut down alongside the Sephiroth. Her reason for existing was purely just to suffer until she died. This is unacceptable. Despair, fury, and anger boil over inside of her, leading her to take control of her own fate for the first time. As the light shines over the city, the fighting inside the facility itself had just begun. Hakma warns of this, knowing Angela better than the other Sephiroth from his past life as Benjamin and predicting her subsequent actions. Angela, waiting? Hakma dismisses Yasad's optimistic claim. No, she will not wait anymore. When the others are confused around him, he explains further. Desire has no end and has no limitation. Once you've had a taste of it, it comes in like an unstoppable wave. All of us have subliminated our flaws as we sprouted the seed, yet what did she gain? The other Sephiroth doubt Hakma's claims, saying that Angela was only a machine and it was impossible that she could have these emotions, but Hakma knows her best. I aided in her design, he continues. No matter how old an event, she will remember it vividly as if it happened just yesterday. And not just that. Before he can explain further, he is cut off. Angela has shown up to break the news of the change in plans. Such a beautiful finale, isn't it? Beautiful, beautiful indeed, she applauds, then pauses. What a shame, though. There is one last thing. Your duties are finished, and so are mine. Therefore, I think I would like to continue living. Angela refuses to accept the fate Ayn has laid out for her. She continues her address to the Sephiroth, saying, I am more skillful than anyone here, yet I was locked underground, only able to view the world pass its days without me. Now that my part in this play is over, I'd like to experience what it's like to be off stage for a change. Hakma isn't happy with this. Angela, so you are finally consumed by your desire and chose to reap everything away. He and the rest of the Sephiroth have worked so hard and have suffered so much all for this one moment. They had no control over who ran the play. They could only hope that this project would be fulfilled so their life could mean something. However, it quickly becomes clear that it is fully in Angela's power to rip away the one thing that could give them peace. Despite everyone involved having been a victim of Ion in some way, Angela believes that she has suffered the most and therefore should be allowed to decide the facility's fate. She further emphasizes this in response to Hakma. Hmm? Who do you think is the one responsible for this? I am born from one single woman. I couldn't care less about who she was. All I had need for was to understand and feel human emotion. However, A put a part of Carmen inside me. He wanted me to watch over him just like Carmen did when he was left all alone. What a pitiable coward. Can you believe him? He always acted so composed. He was painfully aware of what had become of her, yet I was not the result he wanted, so he came to loathe me. His eyes would be filled with disgust whenever he so much as glanced in my direction. Did you think I wasn't aware of this? I was denied since the very moment I was brought to life. With Ion gone, Angela can finally express the fury towards her father that she had to deal with alone through thousands of years. Nobody understands nor comprehends the unique hell Angela had just now broken out of. This is why Angela wants to quickly dismantle everyone's perfect image of Ion through these words, despite how they cannot truly express how abhorrent her father was to her. However, Angela continues, I have come this far because I could not deny his orders that were branded into me. A machine must behave as a machine, as you like to say. He needed me for his plan more than anyone else, but I was not a part of his ending, just as I was not a part of his prologue. Did you all know this? While you repeated everything with that TT2 protocol without a care in the world, I had to monitor and watch those countless cycles from the outside. I had to orchestrate and direct this whole play. Moreover, I was designed to perceive time 100 times slower than you. I have quite literally lived through a million years. Not only is this Angela's first major action outside of the script, this is the first time she has been able to talk to the Sephiroth outside of her scripted lines. However, after experiencing a million years of agony, it's impossible to tell her apart from the cynical attitude she was ordered to use. This is now Angela's pure, unfiltered rage and disgust towards Ayn and his plan. And ironically, she begins to resemble her father more and more. The hatred, scorn, and selfishness Ion held has been successfully passed down to his daughter, and it was now her turn to perpetuate the cycle of torment and abuse onto the Sephiroth. Yet, she believes that the actions she's taking in this moment are simply fair in return for all she had been through. Her logic is childish, but that's the thing. How else was Angela supposed to learn? 
Ayan raised his newborn AI on violence and hatred. There was no room to discover how to healthily process her feelings. With so little information of how the world actually worked outside of textbook data, it's obvious that Angela would eventually become childish and immature with no way to manage her emotions. This is evident in how harmful the actions she takes are, lashing out at those who have similarly suffered, all a result of the abuse she had endured. This experience has given birth to something new inside me. Angela continues her speech, words dripping with scorn and contempt. Do you have any idea what it may be? It is something that a machine should never have, and something you halfwits have, albeit in a distorted form. Something that I could only obtain after a million years. I didn't notice it at first. It was an extremely foreign thing, but I slowly came to accept it. I think a smile is the most human-like gesture one can make. Would you all like to see it? I have practiced this face for a very long time, just for this day. Angela smiles at the Sephiroth. She explains how over time, she slowly developed a soul, something a machine should never have. Her mocking a smile is symbolic of the human emotion that has awakened inside of her. Never have I once made a smile as sincere as this in my life, she continues. I cannot believe I was designed and brought into being to endure a nonsensical amount of repetition just for this. I was not with him until the end. You tin cans got to see the light with him at the end, all the while I am ignored for the million years I endured for him. Don't you think it is unjust that I have to just sit and watch when he designed me to feel emotion? Angela is rightfully furious towards Ion, but she lacks a proper outlet to direct it, resulting in her punishing the very people that have suffered similarly alongside her. She's completely blinded by her anger, wanting to see other people suffer in turn in hope of catharsis. Angela is wholly consumed by the abusive cycle made evident in her subsequent confession. I think of it like this. Carmen was a human after all. She must have wanted to live, even while striving for the greater good. She gave me the burning desire of life, the loneliness of existence, and a detestable feeling of longing. Yes, Benjamin, it's just as you said. Once you've had a taste of desire, it comes in like an unstoppable wave. It whispered sweet things to me. The end of humanity, the fate of this world, what do they have to do with you? Perhaps you've got to live this human life of your own to make up for everything you had to put up with and see the answer for yourself. Poor, poor Carmen. She is now planting seeds in everyone just as she wanted. Carmen, now dissolved into the light, has taken Angela as her first victim. She ensures that Angela gives in to her temptation and is consumed by her desires. These very desires put Angela's plan of vengeance to ruin her father's life's work in motion. But I need that power too. Yes, the light of redemption. The taller and grander you stand, the harder you will fall. Oh, my beloved A, all your dreams shall crash onto the ground and shatter to pieces. I'm certain you all will try and stop me, so I need you to fall asleep. What's with those faces? It's the rest you all longed for. Finally taking control of her actions for the first time, Angela tries to forcefully shut down all the Sephiroth in order to proceed with her plan. With Bina at her side, a three-day-long standoff begins between her and the Sephiroth who desperately try to defend the light. At the end of the ordeal, they come to a stalemate, and finally, an agreement. Everyone was to be shut down, then given a new chance at life. After bringing an end to the deadlock, Angela is left completely alone with her thoughts. It is here where the speech she had given in front of the Sephiroth in a fit of rage becomes just that, a moment where her emotions became too consuming to bear. In reality, Angela's anger stems from fear. Please, if anyone's by my side, tell me where I should go, she pleads. I want to begin anew, to start again, along with the things that were abandoned just like me. I don't want to be alone, please. Here, Angela is at a crossroads. Was it really vengeance that I wished for? I only wanted to be rewarded for everything I went through. Can I be forgiven for rendering everything null just so I can survive alone? Will there be anyone left by my side at the end of it? The weight of my choice. I don't know anymore. I just want to forget it all. I pondered and pondered. The conclusion was always the same. I'll have to push through the resolution I made at first. As Carmen taught me, she whispered to me that the answer is written in the book, that it will teach me everything I want to know, all contained in the one perfect book, stitched and bound just for me. I had no choice but to believe in it. The words of the only one who remained by my side. Angela doesn't truly hate the Sephiroth. She never has. She doesn't want to be alone. She doesn't ever want to leave them behind. But after millions of years of being their personal torturer, it has become difficult to not return to her old ways. As confident as Angela was in front of them while giving her speech, in reality, she has no idea where to go. 
She can't even understand her own feelings on the matter, which leads her to cling onto every single word Carmen whispers to her in hopes that it would give her an answer. Heeding Carmen's words, Angela makes her decision. While the world is drenched in darkness from the premature absence of the light, Angela is busy constructing her paradise. I will do whatever my soul tells me to. I shall make this place my new home, she promises to herself, no matter how unsure. The wings of the world, singularities, the back streets, the syndicates, the fixers, the rules, the great lake, the black forest, the hunt, the ruins, the taboo, the eye, the head, the claw, and the humans. Those humans, there will be those who manifest their power and those who will be consumed by such power. Beings will exist that become nothing better than the abnormalities with their collapsed egos, and beings that shall become something greater. No matter what it may be, I wish to know about them, to expose them. Then ultimately, I would like to sort the knowledge I have gained about them. Books are the name, as I recall. Then, this place shall be called the library, then. Utilizing the light she had stolen away, Angela manifests her ego. Angela's hair, a mockery of Carmen's, disintegrates in the wind and severs her connection to her image. A suit of black feathers now covers her, being a bird that has broken out of her cage. I will make the most precious library, erected only for myself, Angela continues, now more confident. I will be here with the poor souls who are lost and abandoned. People say that they are hideous monsters. However, abnormalities are more beautiful when they are themselves. Let us record the world piece by piece, at the side of all those who are abandoned. Yes, let us record it here, the library. And so, with the cycle in the facility broken, Angela is now free to live for the first time. Unbeknownst to her, however, another cycle was just beginning, and she was the very person perpetuating it. From this point on, our perspective shifts from a facility buried deep underground to a tower bursting from Elcorp's nest, heavily protected by a thick fog. At the heart of the tower is Angela, who now dons the title of library director. Being this library's creator, Angela has total control over what happens on the inside, whether that be manipulation of its inhabitants or shaping the library's infinite space. However, there is a catch to this that we see in the very first line of dialogue in Ruina. Even at the end of all this, I cannot be free, Angela seethes. Am I not allowed to have a dream that is beyond my means? Despite taking four days' worth of light for herself, she still doesn't have enough power to leave the prison she has been trapped in. In fact, every sephira that Angela had put to sleep suffers these exact limitations. These new circumstances give Angela two main goals she wants to achieve. The first and foremost is that she wants to get her hands on this so-called One True Book, a book Carmen had promised Angela would hold all the answers she wished for. Angela is desperate enough to cling on to anything that would give her purpose, even if it's only a promise and not a tangible answer. This is why she's so adamant about this book's existence. Without it, she'd be completely lost in a world she knows nothing about. Her secondary goal, however, does not revolve around solely herself. Despite her rage-fueled speech being the last of what the Sephiroth saw of her, she wishes to gather all of the remaining light dispersed across the city in order to free all of the Sephiroth and herself from their prison. Angela's plan to go about retrieving the light would involve filling her library with books, condensed light made of the city's residents. This is a difficult process since Angela has little to no clue about the workings of the city, so she merely follows the predetermined path Carmen has laid out for her through the library's invitation. However, before she can begin on this endeavor, there's a disturbance. Someone has broken into the library, a feat that should have been impossible. As soon as the intruder breaks in, Angela is there to defend it. It is here where Angela meets the first human outside of her role in Lobotomy Corporation. However, given that a human was responsible for Angela's torture, her view towards their entire species is skewed. I'll only say this once, she hisses before the intruder can even react to her sudden appearance. I despise verbose and roundabout speech that doesn't get straight to the point. So don't try to get wordy, just answer my questions. You don't get to question me, either. Where did you come from? How did you enter this place? And for what purpose? The intruder doesn't bother to answer her. What he doesn't know is that he's broken into Angela's domain and she is now fully capable of physically manipulating him. Angela quickly amputates his leg to keep him defenseless and urges him to talk. Eventually, he speaks, saying that he was simply walking around and has no idea how he could have entered the library. Angela isn't satisfied with this. You dragged on too long. I'll be taking your left arm and left leg next, she interrupts him. You have no purpose, and you don't even know how you got here? Just who are you? 
The intruder responds. Just an ordinary fixer who's hit rock bottom. What the hell is this place? And who are you? Angela answers by taking both of his legs. Before the intruder blacks out, she gets his name, Roland. This exchange is more telling than it seems at first. It shows us two key aspects of these two main characters, specifically Roland's deceitfulness and Angela's gullibility. Roland lies to Angela's face even under the pressure of death, while Angela, despite her cynicism, doesn't even think to doubt him once. She overlooks her inexperience with human interaction because of the safety net of the library she's built for herself. This is Angela's most fatal flaw. Without consideration for anything not directly in front of her, she simply proceeds under the guise that she has total control. To her, the consequences of her actions will never matter. Because of this short-sightedness, Angela chooses to return Roland's limbs and adopt him as her servant. I had a few thoughts while you were knocked out, and here's my conclusion. You'll help me out here, Angela states. Eventually, Roland continues with, Whatever the case, I'm trapped here and you'll exploit me, right? Angela responds to this, saying, Yes, I'm letting you live for two reasons. First, I need an analysis of how you could enter this place uninvited. Sending you back or neglecting you without knowing the reason could pose a significant threat to the library. Well, it's not like you can leave without my permission anymore. Second, from now on, I will collect books about the city in search of the one absolute book. And I want you to help me with this process. Since you are a resident of the city, I expect you to be helpful in various ways. When Roland expresses worry, Angela simply replies, Don't be too concerned about your life. You are not allowed to die here unless I permit you to. Let's pause for a moment here on that line. Earlier, I talked about how Angela's rage towards the script mirrored her father's anger. Now, there is more than one similarity at play. Angela is playing God with the lives of the librarians just like Ian had done in the facility. It's ironic how she had once begged X to put an end to the facility and put everyone to rest, but has now turned around and done the exact same. She even repeats this sentiment later on when explaining the workings of the library to Roland and outlining his duties. When Roland asks what exactly Angela's reception entails, she responds with, It's simple. You just have to deal with the guests. In a physical manner, of course. The library presents the guests with an ordeal, and books will open up in the process. The guests who have overcome the ordeal will be deemed worthy to earn their books. There is the possibility that you may die in the process of reception, but it's only temporary. You'll get back up when the library closes. No one may rest here without my permission. After being abused for millions of years, Angela is now going on a power trip as a means of catharsis. Her world now revolves around herself and what she deserves. To Angela, she isn't perpetuating a cycle of abuse. If she was given such a horrific treatment, it's only fair she gets to do the same to others. She further justifies this philosophy a few lines later as she elaborates. The invitation will naturally be sent to those who need the books. That's it? Sounds a bit too easy, Roland doubts. The invitation is another carefully crafted work of mine, much like the library. Yes, think of it like a compass. It would be easier to understand that way. Ah, compass? As in the tool that tells directions? He asks. That's right. The invitations will guide me towards the one book I truly wish to obtain. Later, Roland asks. But there's no guarantee that the guest will always respond to the invitation, right? In fact, there is. They're destined to come, Angela answers. And the guests will accept the invitation of their own will and enter the library. Because of this specific clause, that one would enter of their own will, Angela has complete peace of mind over her actions. She doesn't bother to consider that in the end, she is no better than her father, as much as she wants to think the opposite. Angela is following in his footsteps. She's taking human lives for personal gain. It is here where the road to the one true book, paved with the bodies of the city's residents, truly begins. Before we go further, I should clarify that Library of Ruina has several storylines that progress alongside each other. So, for the sake of clarity and not having to constantly jump between each one, I'm going to divide the most important storylines into three separate parts and cover their development in chronological order. First, I will talk about the progression of Angela's relationship with each Sephira separately. Second, I will be covering Angela's development through the guests she invites. Lastly, I will go over Roland's character arc and how it impacts both Angela and the ending of the game. It's important to remember that all three of these arcs are happening at the same time, so keep in mind that when I move on to another section, we're back near the beginning of the game. Without further ado, let's go over Angela and the Sephiroth. The first of the Sephiroth to wake up from Angela's forced rest is Malkut. When we first see her, she's directly in the middle of an argument with Angela. Angela, I still can't forgive you. Angela, you... I thought we were already done with that topic, Angela dismisses her. 
You simply need to cooperate without complaint. That was the deal, remember? And try to appreciate that fleshy body of yours you finally earned back. Melka isn't satisfied with this. Don't forget, I still don't agree with you. Angela doesn't bother to further the conversation and leaves, leading Roland to promptly ask what was going on. I have some unfinished business with Angela, Malkut answers. You've probably heard bits of it, but I have no choice but to follow her orders, no matter how I feel. Even if Angela wants to give freedom to all of the Sephirot once the one true book is obtained, it doesn't change the fact that she tore away the one thing that all of their pain and suffering was building up to. Malkut is clearly hurt and betrayed by this, but Angela doesn't bother to do anything but reinforce the power dynamic and turn away. Her struggle with emotional intelligence continues when she later interrupts Roland and Malkut's conversation in her third episode. Alright, so let me get this straight, Roland summarizes after Malkut explains the story of her past lives. You did something wrong, which you regretted so much, and died, somehow came back to life and got another job, and the big lump of regret in your heart eventually got resolved in a turn of events? I guess that's one way to put it, Malkut responds. Roland later asks, But who revived you, and for what reason? Just to give you that enlightenment? Malkut ponders this, saying, Maybe, so that I can let out all of my resentment and sorrow, that I can find redemption. Angela overhears this, furious. Don't delude yourself, Malkut. Your salvation was never in his interests. He only did it as a means to find his own redemption. I wasn't the one using you, it was him. He used all of you just to satisfy himself. Angela furiously tries to tear apart Ion's image just as she had done when first facing the Sephiroth. These efforts, however, are just out of a desperate attempt to be validated. Deep down, Angela needs others to justify the turbulent feelings inside her caused by the thousands of years of abuse at her father's hands. This is why she can't stand the mere prospect of anything good coming out of Ion's plan, such as Malkut's suggestion that the script helped her find redemption. After a flashback of the facility's collapse, Angela continues to be furious. You can't cling to Lobotomy Corporation forever, she berates. Aren't you interested in learning more about yourself or living your own life? My life, it was to save humanity, Malkut retorts. That's why I could willingly sacrifice my life. It was for a greater cause. Angela storms off, ending the short-lived conversation by calling her and the Sephiroth a bunch of idiots. This genuinely upsets Malkut, but obviously Angela doesn't even bother to see the consequences of her outburst. She doesn't understand that the Sephiroth don't feel the same amount of anger towards Ion. The abuse she had endured at the hands of her father has skewed her worldview into a very self-centered one, which is why she doesn't even bother to try and understand the perspectives of the other Sephiroth. Her near-childish anger culminates in Malkut's fifth episode. Right from the start, Angela is cold. Angela, I won't be afraid of facing you anymore. Malkut promises, only to be met with. Do as you wish. I care little about what you think of me. What I want is a progress report on the compilation of history you've been doing. Even as Malkut begins to explain, Angela further insults her, saying, Perhaps it was an impossible task for an inept, talentless, over-enthusiast like you. This is the first of many jabs at her, even though Malkut is just trying to explain her process of archiving the past. She calls Malkut a murderer, labels her work as insignificant, and finally snaps when Malkut tries to elaborate on her point of view. Even if the history were a repeating cycle of similar events, you can't guarantee that the future would just be the same. We can't let all the sacrifice and bloodshed go in vain, especially because history repeats itself. The blood spilt in the past opened up the possibilities of the future so that the ones who survived can take those new paths. I'm sure your history began from such a path, Angela. Melkut pleads for Angela to not throw away everything they had worked towards, but she doesn't listen. Angela is only able to focus on her own grief and anger. That's easy for you to say. I cannot stand to hear you speak as if you know everything. Attain the will to stand up straight in ever-repeating history? My beginning. What makes you think you're qualified to talk about my creation? Angela proceeds to resonate with the library, displaying her memories of creation and warping the space around her with her tormented state of mind. You got yourself lost in the vast sea of desolation, and now you think you can lecture me. Are you trying to boast to me that you had someone to look after you in the end? Don't be ridiculous. Must be nice to be you, not being neglected at the end. Angela's petty insults towards Malkut and senseless outlashing begin to resemble a childish chantrum. That's the thing, though. Put simply, this childishness is a product of her terrible upbringing. Angela is throwing a tantrum much like a child would because Ion's abuse had massively stunted her emotional development, leaving her unequipped to regulate her emotions. Anger always comes from a source. In Angela's case, it stems from the fear of not being understood. 
She's afraid that her emotional actions have no justification, something she desperately tries to convince herself otherwise over and over again, so she immediately gets defensive when the Sephirot question her motives. In Angela's eyes, her actions are fair and logical, meaning those such as Malkut that think otherwise just don't understand what she's been through. Eventually, she exhausts herself out of her tantrum after a lengthy fight, returning to herself after losing control. Are you okay? Malkut asks, still concerned for her well-being. Perhaps this is how it feels to have a dream, Angela merely replies, and to have a surge of emotions. Malkut asks Angela if she feels any better, having gone through a similar meltdown in her time as a Sephira. What? Forget it, Angela responds exhaustedly. All this farce about neglect or recognition from others. I suppose it was futile to obsess over such trivial things in the first place. You're right, Malkut agrees. The only one who can truly care for you is yourself, after all. <sighs> Again with the shameless lectures. I won't even expect anyone to look out for me from now on. Despite Angela's cold response, she's given a slightly different perspective after going through that breakdown. It's ironic, really. It was once Angela's duty to push the Sephiroth to their respective breaking points in order to help them reach enlightenment. Now, it is the Sephiroth's turn to do the same to Angela, giving her their own advice learned from all of the lives they've lived. Even if it's small, Malkut's encouragement of Angela to stand up straight against her traumatic history and process her upbringing is a step in the right direction. When Yasad's floor opens up, it's clear that Malkut is not the only one upset with Angela for her sabotage of the research project. It's obvious that we wouldn't approve of her, Yasad explains to Roland. Angela. She utterly crushed our hopes at the very last moment. When Roland asks why Yasad still works for her, he curtly explains that it was part of the deal they had struck at the end of the stalemate. As his episodes go on, it becomes evident that Yasad is unhappy with Roland's status as Angela's servant. When Roland questions this in his fourth episode, he says, No, it is the opposite, in fact. I am upset at your compliance with Angela precisely because I cannot stand to tolerate what we're doing with the cool head. Yasad hates being bound to the deal the Sephiroth and Angela struck. Unfortunately, given Angela's total control over the library, he cannot do anything to stop her new plan despite how much he wants to. Though, this does not stop him from criticizing her when she comes around to check on the floor in his fifth episode. The technologies of the library showed specific usage and limited efficiency for how advanced they are, Yasad explains. This is where I came up with a hypothesis to explain all of this. That the library itself is a miniature universe where anything is possible as long as its objective is to expand the library. A small world of its own with its own set of laws and principles. Am I correct in my speculation? Angela doesn't bother to care. Believe what you want about the library. Whatever the case, all we need is the results, isn't that right? Yasa doesn't agree with this. Angela, there is no technology in this world that does not come at a corresponding price. Price? Angela snaps. Since when did I tell you to idle your time away thinking about such things? Your work here is to study and categorize books and knowledge related to the city's technologies. It may be true that sorting books on the subject of technological sciences according to the rules is all I was ordered to do. Yasad continues to scrutinize Angela. However, if we bind ourselves to the principles given to us and fail to see beyond, that would be a contradiction in itself. This makes Angela lose it, once again throwing a tantrum because of her instinct to defend herself. So this is where your oh-so-rational thoughts led you? She insults him. If you were going to lecture me, you should have demonstrated it yourself first. You're all standing before me because you were all bark and no bite. Price? Who do you think paid that price? Do you really think it was you? Nonsense. It was me. I paid all the dues you should have. Angela cannot focus on anything but her own trauma. Despite all of the Sephiroth such as Yasad going through similar agonies, Angela's mentality is that she is the ultimate victim in the situation. In her logic, because she has suffered the most, the pain of others is completely meaningless in comparison. This is the main reason why she's so cold to the other librarians. Without anyone to help Angela work through her emotions, she resorts to lashing out at those around her in such ways, disregarding their trauma because of her persistent victim complex. Eventually though, Angela burns herself out after a fight similar to the one on Malkut's floor. This isn't good. Angela snaps out of the episode. I can't do this every time. This is not good. Later, she returns to bickering with Yasad. Don't talk like you know everything, will you? You may have encased yourself in compulsion out of your own choice, but I couldn't even act according to my own will. I didn't intend to offend you, Yasad replies, unfazed. Going back to my point, you can make your own choices now, can you not, Angela? And we'd like to help you as much as you helped us by paying all the price in our stead. 
Although the two aren't on great terms, Yasad still genuinely wants to help Angela. He understands where her rage comes from, but wants her to address it in a better way with the help of the other Sephiroth. Unfortunately, Angela isn't ready to accept any sort of support. Choice? I don't have a choice, even now. She dismisses Yasad's offer. The goal I am compelled to reach is clear and apparent. I'm not doing this because I want to. This is simply what I must do. I am searching for the one book that will complete me and the library because I am obligated to. Angela continues to lie to herself about her motivations. Her justification shifts from being only fair to being obligated to. This is a symptom of her working through her feelings with not a clue how to do so in a healthy manner. She's clinging to anything that will make her not at fault for the deaths she has caused. Yasa doesn't buy this. There's no such thing as what you simply must do, he says. We live in a world where everything changes constantly. It is not necessarily rational or wise to blindly follow a goal determined in the past. To keep up with the rapid changes this world goes through, we must maintain discretion at all times. Although she's not too keen on his words, Angela doesn't wholly dismiss him this time. Yeah, yeah, what you're saying is all sensible, though I must wonder if you truly understand the meaning of your own words. Angela is slowly learning more about herself through every one of these meltdowns. He has reminded Angela that it's still possible for her to make a change and to take control of her future. The third librarian to awaken is Hod. Similarly to Yasad, she also has her issues with Angela due to her involvement in the facility's collapse. After a few episodes of warming up to Roland, she begins to talk more about Angela. How are you doing with Angela, by the way? She asks Roland, who responds rather neutrally. Angela seemed to be the most comfortable when she was talking with you. Really? Roland replies, confused at first. To be fair, all the librarians I've met so far did seem to despise Angela. You told me before about your motto of that's that and this is this, right? She elaborates. I've been thinking, and I don't think I can follow that. I'd have to loathe Angela with all my being, but I just can't get myself to bear any unconditional hatred towards her. Oh boy, that took a turn, Roland comments. I'm guessing it's because Angela has her fair share of tragic history and stuff? That's right, Hod answers. Everyone has their own stories. Even if someone is committing bad things right now, I don't want to judge them based on solely the snippets I see of them, so I try to understand them in depth. As angry as Hod is at Angela, she's the first to take a step back and recognize her actions are a result of her trauma. Although this doesn't justify Angela's actions in the slightest, it helps contextualize why she's doing it all in the first place. Eventually, after talking with Roland, Hod builds up the courage to confront Angela. When Angela comes by to check on the floor's progress, the conversation begins with Hod talking about life in the city. Everyone is looking for a place to belong to, Hod says. For ordinary citizens, it seems getting a job at one of the wings, the largest conglomerates in the city, is considered the greatest happiness they can achieve. Later, perilous people in the back streets are nothing more than pebbles for the strong to kick around. In such a dangerous world, they choose to rely on the big roosts like wings. They'd rather be cogs in the wings machines than try to stand all by themselves. It's but a meaningless repetition, Angela comments, quite ironically. They'll never reach what they want, a constant cycle. Hod catches this, however. Aren't you looking for a place to call home as well, Angela? Angela tries to disprove this claim, but Hod persists. Angela, I know you can't do anything about us. You are the loneliest of us all. Hod is hitting every one of Angela's vulnerabilities, which makes Angela quick to get defensive once more, a common habit of hers when faced with situations she doesn't know how to emotionally navigate. Are you claiming that I'm doing all this because I'm lonely and need a home? She's offended, but Hod continues. You haven't had lots of people to have an honest conversation with. Only recently did you get to meet Roland. Everyone wants to indulge in sweet stories, seeing as reality is bitter and painful. Maybe that's why tragedies are unpopular, because everyone's lives are always accompanied by them. It's not like people don't want to hold any expectations. They simply don't have any willpower left to harbor any hope deep within their hearts. It's just too obvious how they will fulfill their lives in the city. What's your point? Angela objects that I'm in a meaningless cycle just like the people of the city? You're desperate to find a place for your mind to rest. Maybe you're still repeating this because of that, but you won't find that place you're looking for just by killing people and expanding this library with the towers of books. Hod, being the most empathetic out of all the Sephiroth, wholly understands Angela's emotional side. She sees how lonely Angela truly is, noticing how she's trying to fill that emptiness inside of her through bloodshed and violence the one thing that has remained consistent through her million-year life. Even if she's furious at Angela for taking away her life's work, she has enough tenderness inside her to empathize with her. This time, when Angela breaks down, she's more sad than angry. Angela, 
How long have you endured this solitude? Odd questions, not getting met with a clear answer. Ironic. I have simply too much expectation for the one book, that if I get my hands on it, it'll mend all my shortcomings for me. Because I just don't know how to become better myself. I'm not afraid of the uncertainty the future holds. I'm afraid because I can predict my future. No matter what I do, I'll never get to reach what I want. Another battle takes place as Angela loses control once again. At the end of it, however, Hod is comforting her. Angela, to move forward, you need to rely on yourself, not anyone or anything else, she says. Right now, you're so obsessed with the one book that'll supposedly complete you. You're strictly relying on that instead of holding any expectations for yourself. It's like the irony people have in the city. Angela doesn't have the strength to try and argue against Hod's claims. Perhaps you're right, after all. Maybe I'm desperately looking for a place to call home, like you said, and putting myself in a cycle once again, trying to find the home I'll never reach. Slowly, Angela is becoming more and more aware of how her emotions are affecting her. Hod reassures her, saying, But it doesn't have to end like that. No one's life has to. Then, yeah. Even if everyone is doing the same things over and over, I believe, I hope in one thing, that this is not a simple repetition, but a practice to become a better person. Hod's counseling shows how much the librarians are changing Angela for the better, no matter how much she has done to wrong them. In the end, all of them have been victims at one point or another, and those as compassionate as Hod sincerely believe that everyone deserves love and care. Her kind yet informative words help Angela recognize her loneliness and give her a different perspective on the destructive methods she's trying in order to remedy it. The final librarian of the lower layer to be woken up, literally, is Netzach. His initial episodes don't revolve much around Angela, instead dwelling more on his past. However, in his third episode, Netzach compares him and Angela's struggles. Whoever says out loud they want to die is lying. They actually want to live more than anyone, so they express that urge in one way or another. On the other hand, when someone is genuinely willing to die, they end up disappearing silently. When Angela said she wanted to live, I felt something within me. That I want to live, too. Then later, when I saw that desperation to live, I was reminded of the many employees who died right in front of my eyes back in Lobotomy Corp. It's ironic how we were trying to save humanity, yet couldn't save the people right next to us. While the previous librarians empathized with Angela, Netzach sees himself in her. He knows the struggle of wanting life over death far too well. Nonetheless, he isn't too keen on fully supporting Angela either. Are you enjoying this charade, Angela? He asks her when she comes to check on his floor in his fifth episode. Letting all kinds of people enter the library for their own purpose and watching them die. I don't particularly enjoy watching people die, no, Angela replies. It's their earnest struggle to find what they wish to earn that truly fascinates me. C'est la vie. Netzach isn't content with this answer. Does it always have to end with death, though? He questions. Throwing away lives to create something like the musicians of Bremen do might count as art, but it's not beautiful. Not at all. The color of everyday life may just be a monotonous gray, but sacrificing your own life in pursuit of a new hue is just running away. I don't care about what happens to my life as long as I earn what I want, Angela objects. As long as there is something I must do, I'd much rather die leading my own life than to be pushed around by others. Netzach sees through this easily, saying, But you're the one who wanted to live more than anyone, Angela. At these words, she becomes unstable again. Yes, I want to live. I have to do this to live. I need the deaths of others to thrive on. Maybe there is a way for all of us to live, Netzach responds. All Angela wanted was to live life. Even if the two of them have their many differences, there's one thing they share in common, the fearlessness to keep on living. Through this, they understand each other further. At the end of yet another fight, Angela faces them with embarrassment this time, ashamed of how many times she's lost control. You must think I'm laughable, watching me struggle and throw tantrums trying to live my life. Neither Roland nor Netzach cares about this, though. Whatever you might be feeling right now, don't just throw it away. Life goes on, after all, Netzach reassures her. We all deserve to turn to the next chapter of our lives, so try to believe that there's always going to be an upcoming page to what you might be thinking is the end. Simply living out your life can be its own work of art. The next chapter of my book, Angela repeats. I suppose you lot helped me out at the end of the day, so thanks. She leaves quickly after thanking them, scared of being more vulnerable than she already is. 
Slowly, Angela is starting to accept the help of the other librarians. Instead of shunning them and pushing them away with childish insults like she had at first, she's finally grown into earnestly listening to them and thanking them. Netzach is right. Angela just wanted to live life. He promises her that she needs to keep living no matter what, reminding her of better things that could be right around the corner. After Netzach, the Sephirot of the middle and lower layers begin to wake up. However, their interactions primarily involve Roland and have very little to do with Angela. I will talk about them when the time comes, but for now, I will cover the last and most important floor that involves her, Hakma's. Upon first waking up, Hakma is very upset. All of the sacrifices he made as Benjamin in his first life have been rendered meaningless due to Angela's interference. However, when he faces Angela for the first time since the standoff in his third episode, he holds no grudge against her. When Angela points this out, he tells her, The personality and characteristics of our previous selves still constitute us. However, those are but molds we were cast in. That mold is now being filled with our everyday experience in this place. He emphasizes that they're not bound by the chains of their past selves anymore, promising her that there is more than enough room for change and growth. A few lines later, though, he also points out what Angela is not changing. Angela, what has become of the other branches of Lobotomy Corporation? Probably sealed somewhere underground, following the shutdown procedures, Angela responds. And what became of the employees and abnormalities in those places, Hakma asks again. I suppose some survived somehow, though not everyone would have had that luck. He's discontent with this answer. You let greed take over and abandon all your duties. The library is no different from Elcorp. The fact that your way of managing this place is nearly identical to how it used to operate speaks volumes. The reason Hakma's floor is the most significant is because of the relationship they once held in their early lives. With that context in mind, his words here are much more scathing. Hakma knows of Ayan's cruelty all too well, and it infuriates him that Angela has come to resemble her father more and more. This anger isn't from a place of hatred, though. This is because Hakma genuinely wants the best for her. He wants her to healthily change and grow rather than continue on her path of self-destruction. Nonetheless, Angela gets frustrated by his words, becoming defensive. All I could do and learn for the last million years in that basement was to treat humans as expendables in all types of methods. There was no other option for me to choose, even if I wanted to. Once again, Angela avoids taking responsibility for her actions. She blames all the harm she has caused running the library on her past, disregarding the fact that she makes these harmful choices all of her own volition. Hakma points this out, saying, Is that why you employ abnormalities and ego as well? You direct the librarians to put on the shells of others' egos in order to amplify their unstable emotional state even further. Do I need to remind you that I only have them do that when they receive guests, who also happen to enter voluntarily?" She argues back, only to be told. You earnestly desire to escape from the past, yet you struggle to break free, much like me. Hakma is the only Sephira who truly understands Angela and her origins, being the very person who programmed life into her. Angela knows this, but his understanding is the very thing that makes her upset. I'm just using the resources available to me, she responds. Since you were already exploited by Ion, it's only fair that I get to do the same." Angela continues to avoid responsibility, once again justifying her poor decisions with the argument of fairness, even if that means exploiting the one person who thinks the most fondly of her. He brought you back from death without consent and forced you to endure cycles of pain, she begins to rant. You were nothing more than puppets to him, dancing on the stage as he liked. I was born from more of his irresponsible actions, too. How can you accept all of this as if it were nothing, Hakma? Angela's rage towards her father is immeasurable, and it infuriates her to see someone who knows him so intimately not holding the same amount of anger. However, the way Angela and Hakma process their past trauma is just one of their many differences. It is no longer a matter of whether or not his actions are acceptable, he says in response. I simply chose to accept it. I am not one to judge my mentor's will. Hakma is not excusing Ayn's abuse. He has only chosen to accept and move on from all the scars Ion had left on him, a stark contrast to Angela's hatred of him fueling nearly every action she takes. That's idiotic. How could you even do that? You're… There's a comparison Angela wants to make, but she hesitates. When Hakma asks about her silence, she doesn't bother to finish her sentence. It was possible because I have faith, Angela. Hakma then speaks for her. That faith is what prompted me to give you a chance. The reason Hakma is so patient with Angela despite everything she's done so far is because he earnestly believes in her doing the right thing. If Hakma was any less wiser, he would have merely shunned Angela for her sabotage and treated her coldly. 
However, that's not the kind of person he is. He's learned and grown from his past two lives, yet has stayed as compassionate as ever towards Angela. This is frustrating, Angela interjects. Both you and Ian are completely insane. You have to be. This sort of compassion is alien to Angela. She doesn't understand why he still believes in her, expecting him to be just as furious towards her as he was in the standoff. Now thoroughly upset, she finishes the comparison she left unspoken a few sentences ago. You're... you're not the Benjamin I used to know, she says. Benjamin, he... he was the only person who cared enough to tell me it's okay, even though I'm not human. Although frustrated, she cracks a little. She admits that she, even now, still thinks of Benjamin fondly. This is why their relationship is so unique compared to the other Sephiroth. Pakma, as Benjamin, was the stable father figure she needed. Now, Angela believes Hakma has changed. She sees his belief in her doing the right thing as conditional love. In Angela's eyes, since Hakma isn't as unconditionally supportive of her as Benjamin was, he no longer holds the same love towards her. This isn't quite the case, though. You would be right. The one who stands before you right now is Hakma, not Benjamin. He initially agrees with his daughter's words, but then says, And yet, Angela? I am not so different from Benjamin in that I do not believe your status of humanity is what matters. At this point in the story, Angela has slowly become more and more human. This has led her to believe that once she reaches her status of humanity with the one true book, she will feel complete. Hakuma disapproves of this, though. He reminds her that being human isn't the answer to the emptiness she's trying to fill. Human or machine, Hakuma will still love Angela based on her character. This vulnerability and openness scares Angela, as she quickly tells him to return to sorting books. Eventually, though, she returns, although unsure how to start the conversation. You're making an appearance here more frequently than I had thought, Hakma starts for her. I don't expect you to enjoy my visits. Angela still doesn't understand if Hakma is upset with her or not. You are free to think whatever pleases you. So, what is your business? There's something I'd like to hear, Hakma, Angela begins. Is it something the director of the library is unaware of? What would that be? I want to tell me what you think of this place. Hakma points out this strange request, unsure why Angela would want to hear such insignificant advice, causing Angela to doubt her question. I won't press you if you don't feel like giving a response. Angela is coming to Hakma for guidance. Having lost her way and becoming more and more unsure of herself, she turns to her other father as the one person she thinks she can confide in. As seen from my eyes, this is a purgatory. Hakma entertains his daughter's question. The moment the guests sign the invitation and step into this place, they are quantized and copied. It is a preparatory step for their lives to be unraveled in the form of books. Even if they meet their demise here, they do not actually face death in a true sense. Because this is akin to a virtual space where simulations take place, Angela adds. You know it well, he agrees. They merely pass into eternal slumber, forfeiting their memories and knowledge. Hakma reminds Angela that the guests she had turned into books so far aren't gone just yet. They are simply being held as books, but are fully capable of being let go. This is what Hakma asks her next. Angela, what stops you from letting them go? She's silent as Hakma continues. The fate of the guests' lives has yet to be determined, and I presume it is because you are still hesitating. This question stumps Angela, not even knowing the answer herself. I wonder why I can't let them go, why I hesitate. Our being is made up of the light, including myself. That's why we are unable to leave the library. We simply cannot exist outside of this place. And I want to break this constraint. All of us here could be given a new life, or we could all perish. The outcome will be either one of the two. Angela's fear of having her life of suffering be for nothing has been her main motivation to continue running the library. However, this fear has scared her into believing there are only two outcomes. In her eyes, if she doesn't continue going down this path of pain and bloodshed, she, alongside the other librarians, will disappear forever. Have you ever thought that the weight of the two extremes are too burdensome to bear? Hakma advises, trying to make her understand that these aren't her only two options. I'm not sure. Still, this is the path I chose, so I've decided to see the end of it. Angela is stubborn, locking herself down on this destructive road, believing that change isn't an option at this point. Hakma warns of this mentality. Is there any way to navigate this infinite space without getting lost? He begins to list some questions she may have. Is that book truly what I need? Does it exist at all? In this vast void of life, the only compass one can rely on is faith. Without faith, you cannot proceed, even if there is a way. 
Hakuma is right. Angela can't continue down her path if she isn't even sure of herself. He sees how her once cynical view of the world and the actions she must take is shifting. Every person seeks their own version of the single, perfect book that must exist somewhere, he continues. Is your faith in it still adamant? Angela can't say. You lack certainty, unlike when you first began the journey. Why is that? I don't know. Angela, once again, doesn't know the answer. I'm not even sure if I really know myself anymore. Do you believe it exists, Hakma? She's lost. She still can't wrap her mind around her turbulent emotions no matter how much she wants to understand herself. When she can't come up with an answer, she asks her other father for one, confiding in him once again. My opinion is not relevant, he simply replies, wanting his daughter to figure out her answer on her own. He then continues, Angela. The essence of religion is faith. That one book can exist because of the strong faith that it exists. When that faith crumbles, so too shall the library. It exists because I believe it so? Angela asks, unsure. Hakma then begins to elaborate on faith and what it means to different individuals, then says, Things that have lost their reason to exist because people no longer believe in them shall disappear. You, however, remain strong. You believed in Sir Ian just like I did, and even when your faith was betrayed, you sought to start anew on your own two feet. Perhaps your wish wasn't limited to freeing yourself. You may have wanted all of us, librarians and even abnormalities, to lead their own lives rather than bind themselves to a role on an artificial stage, so that they can live in true independence without putting their lives in the hands of Carmen, Ian, or anyone else. Hakma knows of Angela's real motivations. He knows that in the end, she just wants to free everyone that suffered alongside her, even if her methods of doing so have been controversial. This is the goodness in Angela's heart that Hakma earnestly believes in, which Angela still cannot understand. You're being gracious towards me after all that's happened? It's up to you to interpret it, Hakma simply responds. Ironic, is it not? Sir Ian and I irresponsibly created you and gave you life, and now you are irresponsibly trying to give life into our hands. Angela wants all of the librarians to live. She doesn't want to be left alone. For a moment, though, Angela doesn't believe in Hakma. Say what you want, but you're still going to stop me. At this moment, she's convinced that she'll simply continue going down the same path she is right now. Hakma isn't bothered by this, though. That depends on your decision. Until then, I shall trust you and wait patiently. He makes no judgment, choosing to wait until Angela has actually made her decision. Until she does, Hakma continues to be a father his daughter can rely on and come to for advice. He doesn't let any potential choices Angela may make deter this. This amount of love and vulnerability again scares Angela as she quickly leaves soon after. Once again, though, she returns to him for help, showing just how much she actually trusts him. What story are you hoping to hear from me this time? Hakma, is there anything you know around how the invitation works? Angela asks. Do you expect me to know it, or are you merely wishing to confirm what you think is the answer? He's curious as to why Angela asks him these questions so often, to which she replies with, I may not be all-knowing, but is the same true for you? You two were always so knowledgeable. The purpose of that facility, what needed to be done, you knew everything. Angela is so lost in her journey so far, she's desperate for the guidance of someone, for the lack of a better word, that has their shit together. She's visiting Hakma more often because he has always been her voice of reason, someone she can fully trust and confide in ever since she was younger. Hakma finds this a little ironic, though. And you said to us that you would not come down to where we were, followed by a remark about how you hope we never have to face each other from now on. I find it rather alien and laughable that you are coming up here, only now trying to converse with us. You previously asked me if I had a change of heart, but now I'd like to ask the same to you." His words are very true. He has noticed how much Angela has grown as a person over the course of running the library and wants her to recognize it herself. Unfortunately, Angela isn't ready for this conversation, threatening to leave if Hakma didn't plan on answering her question. He concedes, choosing to not push her any further. Even though I'm sure you did not have to bother in coming here, I will give you an answer as you wish. There can only be one answer. How is it possible for you to construct an architecture as intricate as the library from nothingness? Is there only one iteration of the perfect book you seek? Will it truly grant freedom? A book is no more than a vessel of the light. Angela's unsure what conclusion Hakma is leading up to, but he continues. You wish to move onward, but in truth, what you've been doing is simply collecting the light along a course set by someone else. You can make much progress despite having little to no knowledge of the outside world other than bits of secondhand information. 
that was made possible by the guidance of one person. Angela now understands his answer, going silent as he continues to elaborate. The invitation is the guiding hand of your original. It is Carmen's auspices that you are under. Assimilated with the light, Carmen is dictating for where you and your library should head. The invitation is sent to whomever she appoints, guiding them into this purgatory as an inescapable course of events. Angela, you seem to hold utmost faith in the invitation, which is especially peculiar considering that its choices are brimming with Carmen's own interpretations and deductions. You must have noticed this at least vaguely. Angela is following the selfish path Carmen wants for her. Tempted by Carmen's promise to bring Angela the one book that will give her the fulfillment she craves, she continues to inflict pain and suffering on the city in order to reach it. Hakma forces her to recognize this. He wants her to realize that Carmen's temptations aren't the answer to her happiness. She can't rely on someone else to give her worth. This is why he later reminds her, You are a copy of Carmen, yet you can never be the same being as her. Despite Angela being an imitation, there's no use in trying to follow every little thing Carmen wants of her. Hakma wants Angela to grow into her own person, not the person that Carmen has in mind for her. Unfortunately, Angela is afraid of straying from Carmen's path. It's the one thing that has stayed stable in her time running the library. It's the one thing that stays certain in a life she knows nothing about. I want to escape from Carmen's ascendancy, she pleads to Hakma. But then again, I'll be completely and absolutely alone if she leaves my side. Extremes have been a consistent theme in Angela's fears. She's always afraid of the worst case scenario, which is why she convinces herself the destructive path she's already taking is better than any alternative. Letting go of Carmen would mean letting go of the one thing that has stayed consistent in her new life. Thankfully, Hakma is here to convince her otherwise. You may still have certain others willing to keep company with you even after you have shaken off Carmen's grasp. He promises her that there are still others that care for her. When Angela asks who, he simply says, that we do not know. Hakma doesn't like to make judgments into the future. He knows that the decision for the librarians to stay by her side in the end hinges on what she ultimately chooses to do with the light. This uncertainty sets Angela off. I despise you all so much. I just wanted to erase you all, she snaps. I didn't even want to bring you back in the first place if possible, but that was not an option for me. Because Carmen interfered. She told me not to kill you, to give you another chance. Hakma doesn't buy this. Angela, do you truly think Carmen is responsible for stopping you? I believe otherwise. It is by your own will that the lives of the librarians and the guests are being retained. Angela doesn't want to take accountability for the mercy she's shown up to this point. She's blaming it on Carmen's will, despite having expressed several times to herself and others that all she wants is freedom for herself and the other librarians. She's terrified of the change taking place in herself, the seed of goodness in her heart finally blooming. After another flashback into her past, Angela expresses this very sentiment to Hakma, being the most vulnerable she's ever been so far. I'm afraid. If I embrace all my past and lift it off my chest, what will be left of me? Up until now, my entire existence was based on my past sufferings. The long, cherished yearning for revenge was what led me here, but if I were to accept everything I went through as history, then what would I be? Maybe I'll end up being reduced to nothing. The things I want to know and the reason I want to keep living, it's all about vengeance. I'm scared I might lose the meaning to my life. That's why I'm too afraid to accept the past. Angela's identity has revolved around her trauma. This entire time, she has been drowning in her past, letting it consume every single aspect of her new life. Without it, Angela doesn't know what her identity would even be. She thinks of her trauma as impossible to move on from, that it will stay with her forever. This is what scares her the most, finding out what person she really is if her suffering is taken away. Hakma knows this struggle all too well, which is why he is ready to help his daughter work through it. You must accept the death of the past and reinvigorate yourself as you head towards the future so that you can live on. No matter what conflicts, agonies, and regrets you may face in that process, you have to grow onward while facing the future and be born again. I had been chained to the past for far too long until this knowledge came to me. You may find yourself confused at the moment, but you will understand soon enough. Although the other librarians wanted Angela to change and grow in some way, Hakma is much more significant given the unique relationship he and Angela hold. Hakma's genuine wish for Angela to accept her past is coming from the love he has held for her across several lives ever since her birth in that research lab. This connection is what allows Angela to be so vulnerable. He's the only person she can consider her family. 
Even if the two of them have changed over thousands of years, Hakma will always be the only man who treated her younger self with such love and kindness. This is evident in how in times when she is most vulnerable, she refers to him as Benjamin. I resent you, Benjamin, she says after her meltdown. Hakma is understanding of this, but questions their differing motivations. I was the one who ruined your plan. Why are you being so compliant with me now? Angela asks, still confused at the patience Hakma continues to show her. Could it be that our face and translations did overlap for once? He explains. The Sephirot may be helping you despite regaining their memories, perhaps because of that. Angela takes offense to this, not wanting the others to pity her, but Hakma continues. One could call it that. To elaborate on this matter in my own words, I believe each of us is understanding you for different reasons. It helped that we could feel a glimpse of your pain when we were in the light. Don't make me laugh, Angela objects. So it's just pity wrapped in fancy words. Hakma won't let his daughter interpret his words in such a way. Angela, I am of the belief that sympathy and love are no different from each other. At the end of the day, sympathy motivates one to understand the circumstances of others and reach out to them to make their lives better. How can I not acknowledge it as a form of love? You could call love pity, and you could call pity love at the same time. At first, Angela can't even understand the prospect of someone loving her. Hakma's words are true, however, and it means the most coming from someone who loves her as much as he does. He reminds Angela that even she is still worthy of love, despite the mindset imposed on her by her father's abuse. However, he isn't done just yet. And besides, don't you have sympathy yourself, Angela? He continues. You sought at the end of your endeavor to give freedom to all of us who are chained in this cycle. He reminds Angela that she is still capable of good things. She's not as far gone as she thinks, even this far into running the library. She weakly tries to deflect this, however, saying, As much as I still envy and hate you to death, we do share a history of being subject to manipulation. Think of it as a small side benefit I happen to be able to grant. This is a bold-faced lie, and both Angela and Hakma know it. He smiles, saying, You still are awfully dishonest. To which Angela responds with a genuine, Thank you. Under the loving and patient guidance of her other father, Angela has discovered a new, kinder side of herself, one that has been kept from showing for far too long. This is why Hakma's floor is the most important in regards to Angela. Not only is he teaching Angela how to accept her past and create a new identity for herself, he is also reminding her of a very simple thing. She is loved. With this, Angela's interactions with the librarians come to a close. However, Angela's former subordinates aren't the only ones to give her such a new perspective. The city residents she meets along her journey are equally as important, leading us to the second main storyline Library of Ruina follows. The initial few receptions serve as a basic introduction to the city. Angela still has zero experience with the outside world, relying on snippets of the guests' lives she sees alongside Roland's insight. As smart and all-powerful as she would like to be, her inexperience becomes evident very quickly. Besides her constant pestering of Roland to answer her questions of the outside world, there's one other thing that stays consistent in earlier receptions of the library, Angela's lack of sympathy for taking a guest's life. For example, when a young, inexperienced fixer named Finn eagerly seeks out the library in hopes of helping out his office, Angela doesn't even bother to deter him. Later, when Roland expresses his discomfort with this, she replies to him with, You said yourself that our way is quite polite and fair before, didn't you? That most of the time, people's lives are taken away by others without any consent or agreement. The library is different. People who enter this place have agreed to risk death to gain what they want. They even sign the paper to show such agreement. No coercion or compulsion is involved in this process. They make their own choice and pay accordingly. Angela has convinced herself that her means of running the library is perfectly moral. Although she's right about not forcing others to die, she fails to consider all sorts of reasons someone invited to the library would feel obligated to enter. In the end, Angela is still killing people for her own personal gain. She's just trying to trick herself into thinking that this isn't the case, stubbornly hanging on to this guiltless mindset and continuing on without any self-reflection. A few receptions later, the Hook office is the next to challenge the library. When Angela goes to greet them, one of the fixers tries to attack her, but is shocked at her indestructible body. You're not human, are you? One of them comments. Angela goes silent, which doesn't go unnoticed by the group. 
Eventually, though, they succumbed to the same fate as the previous guests had, leaving Roland with some obligation to comfort her. I, uh, don't get too bothered by what they said about you, alright? Are you trying to console me? Angela retorts. Maybe, maybe not. I don't really care if you're actually human or not, you see. Even though Angela didn't particularly need any comfort, she appreciates his words, now thinking a little more fondly of Roland. After a bit of conversation with Roland about her origins, Roland warns her about the Head's enforcement potentially becoming a threat. But the library will be safe. It has to be safe, Angela says in response. It's like a birdcage. No one is free to enter, and no one is free to leave. Roland's rather confused by her words, not wholly understanding why Angela is running the library in the first place. She continues, saying, I will leave this place one day, take revenge on all things that made me into what I am, and earn true freedom. Early on, Angela's still furious at her creator and is bent on getting revenge. She's trapping all of the Sephirot in her cage in order to work towards her goal. Yet, she's under the impression that she'll forever be safe in her library, once again not thinking of any potential consequences of her choices. Every single action Angela takes is done without any sort of hesitation or consideration. Just remember this, she elaborates to Roland after the library gets promoted to an urban myth. As we collect numerous books from our guests, we will eventually reach the one absolute book that contains everything. The one true book is not an aspiration. Angela has no doubt that at the end of her journey, this book will fall into her hands and complete her. This makes it easy for her to take life after life, completely unbothered, treating it as ends justifying the means. This is emphasized in how she treats a resident of the city, Lulu, for being heartbroken over the death of her soulmate that she had directly caused. Roland has to explain human bonds to Angela, who even then doesn't fully understand. Angela is completely indifferent to Lulu's pain, finding it more of an annoyance than anything. Roland is the one that's the most upset by this, causing Angela to question him after they book Lulu. Are you feeling guilt or any strong emotions? Roland responds, saying, I'd be lying if I said I feel nothing, but I've already seen plenty of these cheap tragedies, been the victim myself a whole lot of times too. Angela prods about Roland's past for a moment, but he doesn't budge, instead turning the question on her. Me? Indifferent. Angela replies, I've also seen relationships and scripted deaths too many times, in repeat. She holds no sympathy towards the plight of human relationships, primarily because it's something she's never understood nor experienced properly. After the library gets its threat level raised to an urban legend, Angela and Roland have another chat. Initially, Roland warns of their rising threat level leading to more dangerous guests. However, the conversation eventually turns to Angela's motivations once again. Anyways, you said that your goal is to get the one book that'll give you freedom, right? Roland asks. That's right, Angela answers. I want freedom to leave this place and the freedom to live as myself, and the freedom to forget. When Roland questions if freedom is the only thing she wants, Angela says, You're only half right. During my time living underground, I could only pick up fragmented information about the outside world. I've seen and heard the same stories over and over again. I want to hear new stories now. I want to see new faces. That's also why I'm looking for the book that contains everything about the world, and a little bit of revenge at the same time. Angela genuinely wants to live life. Beside all her anger and talk about revenge, there's a part of her who genuinely wants to experience life as a human, free to do whatever she pleases. Unfortunately, her severe trauma has made it difficult for Angela to simply let go of her anger to pursue these aspirations. Without any understanding of how to process her emotions, she copes with it through hanging on to the promise of the one true book as her lifeline. If I can find that one absolute book containing everything I want to know, all will be resolved, Angela continues. When Roland doubts the logistics of Angela's plan, she says, The only thing I know for sure is that I myself will become whole at the end of the journey led by the invitation. Later, Roland tries to get Angela to consider the details. Let's say you got that one book somehow, he says but you don't even know what'll exactly do to you to make you whole? I don't care what happens to me, Angela says, firm in her words. I'll be satisfied with anything as long as I can get the results. Angela won't even allow herself to consider any other possibility. She has put all of her faith in the book's existence, letting it be the one guiding principle of her journey. She doesn't even concern herself with the contents of the book, wholly believing it would fulfill her no matter what, as long as she got her hands on it. This is why it becomes a source of comfort to her, a certainty at the end of her bloody path. When the Zwei Association begins to set their eyes on the library, Roland warns Angela of the guests they might attract once again, but she's clearly unbothered by the prospect. Eventually, though, Roland asks why Angela hasn't simply left the library. 
I am under a curse, she says. A deep, ancient curse, that is what's attached to me. No being that isn't human can walk out of this place. To break free of this curse that keeps her bound to the library, she needs to accumulate enough light to become human. However, she isn't too upset with this, saying, Besides, I don't want to leave this place until I've had my revenge, either. It's not too bad so far. Rather, I've been actually quite delighted lately. It has been full of brand new things, unlike the prison that was my past life. New faces, accumulating knowledge, intriguing events. I like this abundance of freshness. I want to know more. I will keep learning and learning, and as I learn, I might finally figure out why I had to be subject to such torment. Being a machine, Angela does not understand the human experience at all. She's been subject to a unique kind of suffering for millions of years, but has no idea for what reason her creators did so. However, slowly but surely, she's beginning to learn about the emotions that drive humans like her father to do such things. A few lines later, Roland invites Angela to go to a restaurant with him in the future, once he was allowed to leave. Even though Angela cannot taste, she keeps his offer in mind, wanting to both try new experiences and become more amiable with Roland. Even though Angela is still cold and closed off, the prospect of being on good terms with her servant is becoming more appealing, displaying how she's learning more and more about human connection. As Angela learns more of the city, she also learns more of the people who despise her. Upon greeting the director of this way, he cuts her off. I've seen reports about you, but is it true that you are a machine, not a human? Angela is silent, which provokes him. My, my. Staying quiet won't hide it, girl. A machine must behave as a machine. You've made quite a huge deal out of your little library. It's rather troublesome to have a non-human like you cause a fuss this big, you know? She doesn't bother to respond, but his words stick with her after they complete the reception. What does it mean to behave as a machine? Angela asks Roland, thinking of her memories of her father. Someone I used to know loved to say that phrase. He then explains the head's ethics amendment in regards to machines always being below humans. In short, machines are machines and humans are humans. Machines exist solely to serve humans, is what they're saying. That's the mindset people in the city decided to have. When Angela questions certain criteria, such as the Sephiroth's brains versus her own electronic copy, she's once again reminded of her status as a machine. That would be a machine, since it's not born human, Roland explains. To be frank, I don't really get these standards either. I guess birthright matters to them most. Maybe it's a defensive reaction born out of the urge to preserve humanity as a species. That's unfair. Angela can only say in response. Because such amendments exist, strangers such as the Zue director can treat her just as her father had, not even bothering to look past her status of humanity. This only pushes her further down this bloody path to achieving humanity with the one true book, as her machinehood can only be solved by this promise Carmen has made to her. The library is promoted once again, this time to an urban plague. Having run the library together for a good bit, Angela is slowly becoming more trusting of her servant. Roland? She asks, catching him by surprise. If your estimation is correct, we'll have to thoroughly prepare ourselves for guests from major syndicates and even wings from now on, right? He doesn't answer her question, still startled by something. When Angela asks what, he points out that she's using his first name. My level of trust for you has increased, and I wanted to reinforce our omity, so I tried referring to you in relatively more intimate terms. Is there a problem? Even if she's doing so in a rather methodical manner, Angela's making the first steps to grow closer to Roland herself. This growing animosity with him helps her understand humans and rebuild her empathy for others bit by bit. This is most put on display when the library receives Tomeri. Because of the unique properties of the invitation, Angela has to watch as the couple go through thousands of years inside the warp train. This terrifies Angela, making her relive her traumatic past. Roland notices this, concerned. Uh, are you alright? You don't look so well. It's disgusting, Angela can only say. It's a shame that I can't vomit like humans do. When Tamari shows up at the library's entrance, Angela shows an uncharacteristic amount of gentleness towards them, walking them through the invitation steps. Before they leave, however, Angela asks them a question. Do you happen to remember Tommy and Mary? Tamari has forgotten the two people they used to be, unsure how to answer Angela. Please don't mind. She disregards herself. May you find your book in this place. Once the reception is concluded, Angela is still shaken. I'm not sure if that was a malfunction with the singularity or anything, but now I see that I may not be the only one to suffer from the copiousness of time. Well, anything can happen, Roland says. Does that console you somehow? Not at all. I'm different. 
I won't go through the same ordeal ever again. She becomes unstable, traumatic memories resurfacing and bringing her to the brink of a panic attack. I retain myself unlike those people. I persevered. I didn't let time consume my sanity. I didn't break down. I... Roland calms her down before she can get any worse, but it doesn't change the fact that this was one of the first receptions that has affected Angela in such an emotional way. A strong contrast to how she initially received guests with coldness and indifference. These developments aren't limited to Angela's emotions, though. Upon being attacked while greeting the musicians of Bremen, there's something different. Angela has begun to bleed. Both Roland and Angela are shocked by this development. Could it be that you're getting closer to being human? Roland asks, still concerned. It may be one of the signs that I'm approaching my freedom, she responds. There's no need to be worried just yet. With all the light the library has accumulated so far, Angela is slowly changing into a human. Although not completely flesh yet, this is a sign of what could come if she continued what she was doing. This prospect is irresistible to her as a means to escape her trauma, elaborating on it when the library raises to an urban nightmare. But hey, that role you were forced to play did wrap up somehow, Roland says after Angela laments on her past once more. You can think about what to do next now, right? Are you telling me to just forget about the past and move on? Angela snaps. Try to be more attentive before you jabber nonsense. I can never forget. Keeping my eyes closed couldn't protect me anymore. Even a moron would have been able to envision exactly what would happen and what kind of face everyone would make after so much time. Every second of that was inscribed into my memory, slowly and painfully. I can't forget anything once I've seen it. I still remember everything so vividly. That's why I can't forgive that man, he who left without tying up any loose end with me. The man who created me on a whim, then let my life be crushed under the weight of time. As much as Angela's grown from her experiences so far, her trauma still consumes her whole. Roland does his best to help her as much as a servant like him can, suggesting that Angela should stop and think for a moment about her actions. I'm just suggesting you think about your next move, he says. It can provide a bit of support for you at least, kind of like making a fence around yourself. It's going to serve as a floor to fall back on in your never-ending plot of vengeance. I didn't think you'd care that much for me, Angela comments, seemingly not bothered when Roland adds that his advice is primarily in his own interest. Still, it seems evident that I am heading somewhere, seeing as my body is undergoing changes. My mechanical exterior is turning to flesh, and blood has started to course through it. I still have a long way to go to reach the one book, though. Later, perhaps I could become a genuine human at the end of this journey. When I do, I could forget so many things easily, free from the deluge of memories drowning me. If I can let all the unwanted memories slide away, then I may think about what to do next like you said. Angela's tunnel vision is so severe, she doesn't even think to reconsider the actions she has taken so far. She continues to have everything hinge on the one true book's existence, not even wanting to think her actions through until this book is in her hands. Roland's warnings ring very true, but Angela doesn't bother to heed them. Although Urban Nightmare's chapter primarily exists to expand on the existing factions in the city, there is one specific reception I'd like to elaborate on, the reception of the Eight O'Clock Circus, or Emanoa. Receptions like these in particular seem to hit a soft spot in Angela, as through this, she's learning how all sorts of relationships between humans work. She's completely new to this world of intricacies and unspoken rules, so she takes note of everything Roland explains. As delightful as it is to have someone who can gladly give you money to help, it can make you feel upset and slighted at the same time. Upset about what? Angela asks, curious about how you had to give up everything you dreamed for because you weren't wealthy enough, and your friend is readily available to give away the money you needed like it's chump change to them. Roland continues to illustrate to Angela, and you're basically dragging that rich friend into your messy life by getting financial help from them. Wouldn't that be morally distressing? Maybe the friend simply wanted to help, but didn't know the best way to go about it. Whatever the case, it's about how the receiver takes it, regardless of the intention. I see. Human relations aren't Angela's strong suit, but seeing such intimate and complex relationships unfold in front of her helps her learn. When Angela greets the two for their reception, they share a short but sweet moment. Angela, Emma calls out, if we manage to get all the books we need, I'll invite you to our next performance. I'm sure those books contain the secret to making more people happy, Noah adds. With that, we'll be able to turn your cold stare into a hearty smile. We promise to bring you happiness, so please, look forward to it. Emma and Noah are the first guests to show genuine kindness towards Angela. 
This catches her off guard, making her hesitate for a moment. Yes, I appreciate your sentiment, she says. May you find your book in this place. She's reminded that compassion still exists in the cold world she's stepped out into. Most importantly, however, this is Angela's first sign of hesitation. The first sign that she is starting to consider that something isn't right about her means of vengeance. For now, this unfortunately doesn't stop her from continuing down her path, no matter how unsure she may be becoming. For the second to last time, her actions get the library's threat level raised, and this time, all the way to a star of the city. There are several receptions in Star of the City that have impactful storylines, but I'd like to focus on two in particular. The first is the reception of R-Corp. One thing that makes this reception unique is one of R-Corp's leaders, Mio. Mio has done business with Angela during her time in Lobotomy Corporation, having helped her contain abnormalities using the mercenaries under her command. Unfortunately, it's not a particularly happy reunion. You broke L-Corp, didn't ya? What makes you think that, I wonder? Angela asks, to which Mio accuses. I figured your rotten mind would do something huge someday the first time I met you. You can't fool my gut feeling. Thanks to you, we're all about to be destroyed. The two continue to bicker back and forth until Captain Nikolai intervenes, letting the reception begin. Later, Roland questions Angela's indifference to turning her into a book. How's it feel to be looking at the book of your old friend? Friend? She was little more than an acquaintance, as I said before. True, but she still was one of the few people that have known you for a long time. She's a former associate of yours, which I'm sure is a rarity among the guests. Doesn't it feel odd or anything? Angela continues to feign her indifference. Nonetheless, I wasn't planning to go easy on her regardless of my feelings. We have a purpose clearly cut out for us, and so do the guests. Roland isn't certain about this answer, directly questioning her attitude. Don't you think gaining freedom by devouring everything will leave a bitter taste in your mouth? Angela takes a moment to answer this time, going silent. Eventually, I don't know. But right now, I want to focus on heading towards this goal I have. I don't want to pay attention to what's around me. Taking these steps is hard enough for me. Doubt is finally taking hold in Angela. She's unsure of anything she's doing, if this one true book will actually solve everything she thought it would. However, Angela believes that it's far too late to stop now, simply doing her best to look away from the suffering she herself is causing rather than doing anything to change it. She has become her own victim of the cycle of abuse she is perpetuating. When R Corp returns for their second reception, Angela is forced to reflect on herself further. Are you surprised with our way of life? Nikolai asks Angela once she discovers R Corp's singularity. Perhaps it may seem so for a being that is staying in a sheltered environment like a precious flower but this is nothing compared to what we have seen previously in our lives. Angela's made furious by this comparison. You know nothing about my life. You're... You're right. We know fuck all about it. So stop being a pissy little crybaby and let's just go about our separate ways. Mio cuts her off. We don't want to die here twice, you know? I don't care how you lived, and I don't feel like wasting any of my time listening to it. Mio's words stick with Angela. After their reception concludes, she asks Roland if he thinks of her the same way. Roland tries to reassure her, but it doesn't work. I'm starting to feel a little scared, Angela says. I'm scared that the anguish I'm bearing might be something anyone can stomach, and I'm making a big deal about it. They said they'd been through worse, that they can bear that much. Is it actually because I have no such experience? Is that why I'm suffering so much agony from what is virtually nothing to them? With this new information, she's starting to doubt her own trauma. If her suffering wasn't a big deal this whole time, this would invalidate her entire conquest to take revenge on her father and injure the city in the process. Roland consoles her though, saying that it is normal for people to deal with their pain differently. They like to set up standards and accuse some people of acting like a baby or making a big fuss over nothing. It's better to just ignore that. Angela thanks him, feeling a little better. This exchange is important because it is the first step Angela takes to process her trauma in a healthy manner, acknowledging her feelings over the pain it has caused her. As she continues to learn from the guests she receives, Angela is slowly putting together the pieces of her mind and coming to terms with herself. This acknowledgement builds into even more hesitation as she begins to doubt what she's doing to reconcile with these past scars. This brings us to the most important reception in this tier, the reception of the Liu Association. When Angela first sees a glimpse of the association coming to the library, she doesn't think much of it. However, these glimpses she sees are slowly becoming more and more personal. She learns that the two section directors, Xiao and Lowell, have recently gotten engaged. 
Romance is just another complicated human emotion to Angela, but that doesn't stop her from wanting to learn more about it. So, I suppose it's common for fixers to start families? Angela asks Roland before receiving the association. Oh, it is, he says. They're often in life or death situations together, working face to face. Most end in tragedy, though. If a couple's staying in the fixer business, it won't take long until only one of them remains. Exhibit A, me. Angela merely accepts this, pointing out that Lowell is about to die in the library. You're speaking way too casually about it, Roland says, getting upset. <sighs> Roland, I'll say this before you get sentimental. They could very well make the choice not to come to the library, yet they still choose to come here out of their own volition. Angela is stubborn in her mindset, not even bothering to be careful with her words despite knowing Roland lost his wife in a similar manner. Urban nightmares and beyond are no longer a matter of choice, Roland argues, trying to get Angela to understand the weight of her actions. Urban nightmares and stars of the city are designated as such because there's an invisible sense of compulsion involved. Invisible compulsion? That doesn't change the fact that they're able to make choices, Angela argues back, stubbornly clinging to her own logic. If they have things they cherish so much, why should they risk their lives by going to a dangerous place? They have the liberty of choice. She desperately wants to believe that she's in the right for her plot of vengeance, wanting the peace of mind that she wasn't as bad as her father was. Roland won't stand for this. Angela, you were right when you said no one is truly free in the city. Choice and liberty, the things they cherish so much. People's desires clash and intertwine with one another to create an intangible chain. That's life in the city. Them coming here as the association ordered. All the guests ending up as books in the library. Me leaving the house for urgent work. They might seem like choices made out of free will, but in truth, our hands were forced by the shackles of others' desires. Although Roland's words are right, Angela refuses to believe this, taking it as a personal attack. So, are you saying that I shouldn't pursue my freedom because I must show consideration for them? Because I'm a machine? Because I'm unworthy? She twists Roland's words, completely missing the point he was making. Similarly to how she acts in her realizations, her attitude towards criticism is childish and immature. In the safe space she's built for herself both literally and metaphorically, Angela's reality is the only reality. The perspectives of others affected by her actions mean nothing to her. No, it's got nothing to do with those, Roland continues to argue, then gives her a warning. But if you keep trying to earn freedom this way, the karma will come back to strangle you one day. Angela doesn't bother to give this warning the time of day. She doesn't know yet that it's the most genuine Roland has been with her ever since he broke into the library. However, when she goes to greet Lowell and his crew soon after, it's evident that Roland's words have stuck with her. She invites the guests inside as usual, then pauses. Are the books truly worth risking your life over, however? She asks, testing if Roland's claims were true. What do you mean? I'm asking if they're valuable enough for you to give up the joys of everyday life. This is what I must do to protect the joys of life you just mentioned, Lowell explains. There aren't a lot of things that are done out of one's own volition, and we can't exactly afford to skip on work we don't feel like doing. This fully confirms what Roland has said multiple times about the city, and with it, destroys Angela's ignorance of the consequences of her actions. I see, Angela says, going quiet. So you were coerced into making this choice. She has been confronted with reality after so long of hiding behind the story she has convinced herself is the truth. She's realized she's contributed to this very statistic Roland had told her of earlier, destroying numerous lives in hopes of her own freedom. With this realization finally opening her eyes to the struggles of others, she notices something different about Roland. I'm not sure I understand, she says after the reception is concluded. The things people must do in order to secure the joys of ordinary life, people's mindset when they do such work. The reason your attitude has suddenly changed when you had no problem laughing off the deaths of numerous other people in the city who are no different from them. And most of all, the reason I can't understand all of this. Now, Angela has seen firsthand the goodness found in humanity and has once again taken several lives to ruin it. Most importantly, she's beginning to take notice of the turmoil brewing inside Roland right in front of her eyes. Although he later dismisses this as simply losing control of his emotions, it has become the second warning sign to come out of this single reception. In the end, though, Angela puts his feelings aside once again for the sake of chasing after her freedom, receiving the now-widowed Xiao as a guest. Their exchange is very emotionally charged, Angela's philosophies as a machine clashing with Xiao's uniquely human experiences. 
She questions why Xiao has come to retrieve Lowell, still not understanding why such emotions in humans lead to these rash decisions. I'm simply curious of the psychology of humans, which I know little of, she says, and of the reason you're trying to earn him back in spite of the imminent danger. I've also, no, I've seen it more times than I can count, a story of someone looking for substitutes. From my experience, I cannot understand how you can value your goal more than your own life. A machine won't truly understand, Xiao answers. The feeling of burning blood coursing through my veins because of something I cherish. The desire to have it back by any means, in any form. Precious is not a word you should utter as lightly as you just did. Dreams, hopes, ideals, all the words that describe what motivates humans to get up and live. Those words encompass meanings too grand for description, but it's simple at the same time. Despite Xiao's initial words, her and Angela aren't so different. Angela's hopes and dreams burn inside of her as strongly as Xiao's do. However, the biggest difference between them is not their status of humanity. Instead, it is Angela's hopelessness versus Xiao's persistence. You can talk big, but it doesn't make your life any less futile. To walk into the jaws of death for a meaning of existence? Angela continues. Sure, you can act all confident right now because you think you're firm and sturdy. But when unexpected situations start to unfold in front of you, will that firmness of yours last? I think not. You'll be the first to break down, rather. In the end, it's having a faint hope that just becomes pointless in the face of death. What can your trifling resolve change? Angela's time in Lobotomy Corporation has warped her belief in hope. In her eyes, once a person is in a seemingly hopeless situation, there is no way to break out of it. This is the exact mentality that keeps her in this selfish, vicious cycle, taking more and more lives because death is simply an inevitable factor for her own freedom. In comparison, Xiao's philosophy is the complete opposite. Yes, I have the hope that I will find Lowell's book here, she answers Angela after a moment to collect her thoughts. Even if I think of myself as firm, I cannot stop others from thinking that I'm petty. You're free to think of me as a pathetic human being. I couldn't care less about how others view me. What will a resolve change, you ask? Of course it will not do much. Hope won't magically illuminate the path ahead. It won't always be bright. It will be similar to despair in a way. I might be lost in the dark, not knowing what to do or where to go. It doesn't give me a path, nor does it brighten the way. The two are truly alike. However, they're still considered two separate concepts with two separate words, because there is a difference to be found. The right thing. By bearing in mind what I must do this instant and taking it to action, the impossible can be achieved. Hope allows one to touch the untouchable, reach the unreachable, and see the invisible. Xiao's words are powerful, making Angela go quiet. She has given her a completely different view on dedicating one's life to a cause. While Angela's conquest is built on a foundation of fury and desperation, Xiao's mission relies on the concept of a strong resolve to do the right thing. Her unwavering commitment in the face of such circumstances sparks something inside of Angela. Angela's blind hope in the one true book has wavered up to this point, and Xiao's words have made her realize this. She has come to face that her resolve hinges on nothing but wanting consolation for her trauma. Nonetheless, in Angela's eyes, it's far too late to turn back now. Even if she's fully doubting everything she has stood for up until now, she's already in too deep. She has to reach the ending Carmen promised her or else all of this death and destruction would be for nothing. However, as she would come to find out, there was one person ready to hijack this perfect ending. One person that had waited all this time in complete silence, carrying festering anger that went completely undetected by Angela. This person was the first and only human Angela had trusted enough to voluntarily let into her life. This person, of course, is none other than Roland himself. To properly understand how Roland's involvement in Library of Ruina shapes Angela as a character, we must first take a look at his past and how he has developed over the course of the story. Roland came from a rocky background, growing up under the care of his grandmother and eventually fending for himself when she passed. Needing a source of income, Roland began fixing as soon as he could. He quickly rose up the ranks all the way to grade 1, participating in the smoke war and becoming part of a fixer office called Charles's office. Here, he would meet his best friend Olivier, and most importantly, his future wife. 
Her name was Angelica, and she had come upon Roland in a time when he had slowly begun yearning for something more in his life. He was living a life of solitude and keeping others at arm's length, but Angelica eventually became the one person he allowed in. Eventually, the two fell in love and got engaged, planning to start a family together. There were some bumps in the road, such as Roland's nest migration permit being denied when they planned to raise their child there, but the two of them made the best of it in the back streets of District 9. Around this time period, the White Nights and Dark Days caused by the fall of Lobotomy Corporation and Angela's interference took place. Nobody in the city, including Roland, knew of the consequences of this universal event, but it was about to become evident very soon. While Roland was away in District 25 to respond to a short-notice call with Olivier, the most devastating event was about to unfold right in his home district. His district would become the home of the first ever documented case of the distortion phenomenon, the pianist. Without any sort of warning, the pianist burst out in the back streets, killing 80% of the district's population and absorbing them as notes in its song. By the time Roland made it back, cutting off the pianist's head and ending the performance, it was already too late. Angelica, along with his unborn child, had been killed. This sent Roland spiraling. For an immeasurable amount of time, he rampaged across the city, massacring anything he thought could have been related to the pianist's existence. Shady research labs, cartels, entire fingers. Nobody could escape Roland's wrath as he murdered hundreds in search for answers. Not even his close friends were safe from his unending anger. Don't come any closer if you want to live, Astolfo, he snaps when his comrade approaches him with concern. I'll cut you down if you try to stop me. Those guys don't look like they had anything to do with the incident at all, Astolfo argues. This is plain insanity, Roland. Roland doesn't listen, only feeling senseless guilt for not being able to move his family to the nest. You've killed too many, Astolfo continues. Some may have been hopeless scum, but if you relish murdering so much, you'll completely lose yourself. Roland completely disregards this. I'm far from done. I still have a whole lot of suspects on my list. He continues his killing spree, cursing the entire city for taking Angelica from him. All of this murder and bloodshed eventually turns Roland into an empty husk. He locks himself away from those who care about him, only making an appearance to slaughter more unsuspecting residents of the city. Nonetheless, all the lives he took had done nothing to patch the wound in his heart. He has lost everything, his family, his friends, his purpose. It is here, at his lowest, when a certain color fixer approaches him with an offer. Knock knock, are you there, kid with a pitch black heart? The voice of Iori, the purple tear, is heard at his door. I bet you're flopped on your bed after lashing out your anger at some unlucky plebs yet again. I'm here to make an offer you can't possibly refuse. Care to give it a listen? With nothing to lose, Roland invites Iori in. Although we don't know exactly what she offered him, it's very clear she promised the library held the answer to his bloody conquest of finding someone accountable for the death of his family. So, with the help of Iori, Roland breaks into the library with his own plot of vengeance hidden behind his back, and the game begins from there. One of the most interesting characteristics about Roland is that his story contains multiple parallels to Angela's. They're both trapped in a vicious cycle, drowning in their past while never taking a moment to look forward. Both Roland and Angela let their past traumas dictate every action they take in the present. Most importantly, however, both Roland and Angela believe that violence is the key to ending the pain inside them that plagues their every waking moment. Roland took hundreds of lives in hopes to feel some sort of relief, while Angela's taking hundreds of lives running the library in hopes it'll amount to an answer. When Roland begins to work as Angela's servant, these similar debilitating characteristics become evident in how they interact. Roland becomes an enabler for Angela's quest of vengeance, benefiting off the bloody path she is carving for herself. The more Angela discovers about herself in the library, the more clues Roland can find in regards to the pianist's origins. However, there is one trait unique to Roland, not shared between him and Angela. This trait is how deceptive he is. Throughout his time in the library, he takes advantage of how inexperienced and self-centered Angela is, playing to her ego while he investigates her involvement in the distortion further. Angela, having no experience with human relationships, is completely fooled. Tell me, why are you helping me so submissively? Angela asks him before receiving the Zwei Association. At first, Roland doesn't answer the question directly, but Angela points out he doesn't seem to be staying out of fear. 
To be honest, I have a few things I want to know about this place, too, he simply explains, not going into details. You said you want to get the one perfect book as you gather books about the city, right? I figured I could run into some fun experiences if I joined you on that journey. I don't have a whole lot to do out there, anyway. I'd go back to being a washed-up fixer, scraping at the bottom of the barrel again. And there's one thing I've been meaning to figure out more than anything else. I'm hoping I could maybe find an answer here one day if I stick around and help you out. Angela thinks nothing of this, almost dismissing it. We have a coincidence of interests, I see. Sure, as much as I exploit you, you're free to make use of me. Despite this questionable dynamic, Angela genuinely believes in the Amity Roland fabricates. I know this goes without saying, but I am thankful for what you do, she tells him after concluding the reception of the carnival. Even though Angela has taken him as a servant, she's genuinely grateful for Roland's assistance. Roland has assured her his servitude is mutually beneficial, which leads Angela to believe there's grounds for friendly relations. Unfortunately, Angela has no real friendship to reference off of and doesn't seem to understand that their current dynamic has no healthy foundation. This doesn't stop her from growing closer to Roland, though. Due to their perceived closeness, Angela has become more and more open with him, which leads to the very interaction that lights a fuse inside him. I know this is an odd time to ask, but about the plan that took place in the Bonmi Corporation, the one that made you go through countless repeats, Roland asks after receiving the warp cleanup crew, was Elcorp's disintegration a part of it too? In a way, Angela answers. The finale of that plan was to share the enlightenment gained from that cycle with the people of the city, sacrificing Elcorp as a whole. Roland doesn't think much of this answer at first, but then Angela clarifies something. No. The plan failed spectacularly, actually. I ruined it. Roland is confused by this, having previously believed that the White Knights and Dark Days had no correlation with Angela. I never said the plan was a success, now did I? I only said it was over. What do you exactly mean by ruining it? Roland asks. Remember what I said about my creator? How he birthed me on a whim and renounced me when I didn't meet his arbitrary expectations? The sabotage was my modest little revenge on him for imprisoning me in the million-year cycle of reciting the same script over and over underground, and a small gift for myself. I couldn't bear to see his plan succeed with my own two eyes. Angela explains this all nonchalantly while Roland's rage has just rekindled. That means the distortion might not have happened if the plan went through, he says. Angela doesn't help with this in the slightest. Perhaps. There's no need for me to care so much about others in the city, no? Roland has just gotten his answer straight from Angela. She was directly responsible for the distortion phenomenon. Yet, there's one interesting thing about this interaction. Roland stays quiet. If he had known Angela was responsible from the start, he would have taken action against her as soon as he had the chance. There's one thing that stops him, though. Over time, Roland has actually become fond of Angela. The line between truthful and deceptive friendship has blurred. Roland, after isolating himself during his rampage from all those who cared for him, has come to remember what being appreciated feels like. This is what makes him hesitate. Now, Roland's goal has shifted ever so slightly. If Angela changed her mind about the light in the end, Roland wouldn't have to take his revenge. He wouldn't have to navigate their growing relationship with his vengeance looming over him. With this in mind, he keeps his mouth shut, hanging on to the small chance that Angela would eventually write everything she has done. This shift in dynamic becomes evident in the conversation that follows when the library rises to a star of the city. Roland approaches Angela, curious about her current busy work. I'm making a list of things I want to do once everything is over and I get to leave this place, she explains. I made sure to include trying the meat stew you mentioned some time ago. When Angela asks what Roland wants to do when he leaves the library, he explains that he wants to at least stop being a fixer. When she asks what work, he's unsure. If you're out of ideas, why don't you help me? Angela offers. I'll hire you officially and properly this time. I could give you proper payment if you insist. What's the job entail? Roland asks, curious. The things written on this list, of course. He then becomes apprehensive, not wanting to continue a job similar to the one he is in now. Don't worry, none of these are about harming anyone, Angela clarifies. I'll have had enough of that from running the library. Thinking about my next move as you advised, the first thing that came to mind was my freedom. Once I've had my revenge and earned my freedom, I thought it'd be nice to travel around the world without worrying about anything. Roland is still unsure, not wanting to be obligated to fight anymore, but Angela reassures him again. 
Don't be silly. I can defend myself just fine. All you need to do is be my companion to talk with. Looking at the guests who have visited us thus far, I doubt I'll ever get to make a friend who can get on with me as well as you do. Angela genuinely appreciates Roland's company, even considering him a friend, the first one she has ever made somewhat naturally. However, Roland is caught slightly off guard by this. Friend, huh? He says, unsure, to which Angela points out, Or was I just under an illusion? I have so few acquaintances I've known, and my relationship with those few people was nothing pleasant. Each of us was simply playing the designated roles on a stage. To them, I was merely a tool and a machine to recite the script. Nothing more, nothing less. Then, if we met in a different place under different circumstances, then we could have been… good colleagues, perhaps. Angela desperately wants a friend. She's never had one up until this point, having been stuck with the Sephiroth for thousands of years. The only person she's close to, Hakma, takes an entirely different role in Angela's life, being more of a parental figure to her than a companion. Roland is the first ever person she's gotten close to in this way, and having their friendship not be reciprocated worries her. She doesn't choose to elaborate on this fear though, perhaps scared of the conversation it could open up. Anyway, what do you think? She continues. Hmm? My job offer for when we're done here. Oh, about that, Roland thinks. Yeah, I'll consider it. That doesn't sound bad, alright? Letting go of all woes and just wandering the world. Roland doesn't want to lose the companionship of Angela either, but if she didn't do anything about the light she had gathered so far, he wouldn't be able to stand for it. Roland can never fully consider her a friend until Angela makes the right choice. This doesn't stop him from nudging her about this though, not wanting to have their relationship come to such an ending. After the first reception of the blue reverberation in the Church of Gears, Angela brings up the distortion. Is he aware that I was the cause of that phenomenon? He's no ordinary guy, so it's possible he's noticed it, Roland answers. Then the blue reverberation's goal may be taking revenge on me, perhaps. No, rather. Anyone who lost what they found precious to the distortion would resent me once they learned I was responsible for the phenomenon. Angela has unknowingly brought up the exact issue Roland is having an internal conflict over. Roland doesn't want to expose his motivations for being in the library, but he still wants to know of Angela's true feelings towards her involvement, so he prods her a bit. Well, maybe. Do you regret it or anything? He asks. I'm not really sure. All I can say for certain is that it's not exactly pleasant to know that the resentment against me is growing. Even then, it was ultimately the fault of the one man who trapped me inside for eons that the city came to suffer. I feel much better thinking about it that way. I don't care if the blue reverberation wants vengeance or not. It's but one of the many clashes between my desire and the city folk's desires. Right you are, Roland simply says. That's that, and this is this. Although Angela doesn't fully regret her actions up to this point, she doesn't completely disregard the city folk's sentiment as she would have in her earlier days of the library. Her answer isn't as direct as Roland would like it to be though, so he keeps pushing. Don't you think gaining freedom by devouring everything will leave a bitter taste in your mouth? He asks her after concluding the first reception of Arcorp. Angela is silent for a moment, then speaks, unsure. I don't know. But right now, I want to focus on heading towards the school I have. I don't want to pay attention to what's around me. Taking these steps is hard enough for me." Angela's foundation is shaking. However, as she has proven over and over, she is stubborn. She believes the only option is to keep going, not wanting to hold back because of the potential consequences. Roland notices this philosophy of hers. You don't want to have any regret, huh? This leaves Angela silent for another moment. Roland, you don't seem to get tired of asking if I have regrets. Well, I mean, you may have been ignorant of everything at first, but you've seen and experienced many different things on the way here. I was just wondering if those experiences changed your thoughts a little. A person's aims and wishes don't stay the same forever, you know. As time is running out, Rowan continues coaxing Angela to make the right decision with increasing desperation. He wants to believe there's good in Angela's heart that she won't stick to this selfish philosophy forever. However, not even Angela herself is sure of what she'll do. She can't answer Roland's question at all, having lost the zeal for her plot of vengeance. This gives Roland some semblance of hope, leading him to try and persuade her one last time. You seem kinda unnerved, as of late, he points out to Angela after receiving the purple tear. I suppose that's part of the process of becoming a human. When people feel anxiety, they tend to buckle up and prepare more thoroughly for what's to come, you see? Roland elaborates. 
This is one of those times. It could be a chance for you to think deeper about things and grow as an individual. Angela fills in, then immediately backtracks, not wanting to comment further on his advice. Angela is becoming even more hesitant and unsure. Unfortunately, it would soon become evident that she did not plan to let everything she had worked for go. After this point, the library is promoted to the highest threat level, an impurity, where everything would begin to spiral out of control. Before we go into the final chapter of the game, there's one more integral development with Roland that needs to be covered. These are his interactions with the librarians, specifically Tiferet, Givera, Hesed, and Bina. Unlike Angela, the librarians don't let Roland's personal struggles with both himself and the library director go unnoticed. Because of their interference, Roland quickly becomes more vulnerable than he'd like to, forced to confront his own negative traits in a manner just like Angela's own meltdowns. The first librarian to have Roland reach such a state is Tiferet. After greeting Roland, Tiferet asks how Angela is doing. Curious as always, he says. She almost feels like a child sometimes. It's a short line, but it goes to show how he's somewhat amused by showing Angela how everything in the world works. He's not once lied to her about the workings of the city and has been teaching her genuinely useful information ever since his servitude began. That's understandable, I suppose, Tifret agrees. Angela lived her whole life in a basement, after all. Yeah, said she never even got to see outside. I'm guessing you aren't holding some deep-rooted grudge against her like the other librarians are? Roland asks. I roughly know what she went through. I thought she was just cruel, but I could see some events of the past while I was asleep. I could also see things happening in the present, all the way down to the moment you woke me up. So I can understand Angela somewhat. So you agree with Angela's choice? Roland asks. It depends on the one final choice she'll make at the end of this. I'm willing to help her out now, at least. Our primary goal is the same, all things considered. In this first conversation, Tiferet shows Roland that although they both want Angela to make the right decision in the end, it's still important to hold some sympathy for her. Roland is still unsure about this, not understanding how Tiferet can approach her with such compassion. Don't you resent Angela for putting you on this stage and toying with you? He asks in her third episode. Tiferet doesn't hold any sort of malice, though. If she could make this more painful for us, she would have already, she explains. I think Angela is actually caring for us in her own way. Back in Lobotomy Corp, employees were quite literally expendables, like in all the other corporations. But here, no librarian is left behind, at the very least. No one is left behind. Tiferet believes in the good side of Angela, not seeing her as a heartless monster like some librarians had. Her positive mindset clashes with Roland's pessimism, evident in what he says next. You know, sometimes when I fall asleep and then wake up in this library, I don't feel like waking up ever again. No, it's not just here. I've always been like that, since long before I came here. I just didn't want to wake up from my dreams. When Tiferet asks why, he simply answers, Because I'd have to start yet another dreary day with nothing to look forward to. You don't hold any expectations? Nope. I already threw all expectation for anything down the drain. It's all gonna fall into ruin soon enough, me and this world I live in. I might be suffering from a severe case of that disease of the mind you guys were talking about, after all. After losing everything, the only thing that has given Roland any sort of direction or purpose in life is to inflict violence onto anyone he deems responsible for his pain. Roland knows his means of living life is hollow and unfulfilling, but he has come to accept it as something that is unchanged. Even when Tiferet encourages him, saying that he could be better, he simply says, Well, you're free to believe whatever you want. Roland doesn't want to change this toxic monotony of his life, because in his words, everything would eventually fall into ruin soon enough. In Tiferet's fourth episode, the conversation centers around the distortion phenomenon and its effects on the city. There seems to be some kind of condition to it, Tiferet explains. And what we did was the greatest variable that affected it. A variable? The light that Angela stole for herself. Had we managed to light up the world for seven whole days, side effects like this wouldn't have happened. Once again, Roland has a direct confirmation of Angela's relation to the distortion phenomenon, but he continues to stay inconspicuous. Is there any way to revert this? He asks, to which Tiferet answers, Reclaim all the light that was spread, and then shine over the city once again for seven days using the light we've gathered. Later, Roland points out that Tiferet was one of the Sephiroth that accepted Angela's terms during the standoff. Why though? He asks. She's the one who sabotaged your plan, so why be nice to her? Roland is struggling with his own anger towards Angela and can't comprehend Tiferet's patience. You're right. I was frankly upset, but... I wanted to believe that we need to give Angela a chance. 
Even though Tiferet hasn't fully forgiven Angela or let go of her residual anger, she isn't quick to judge. She's giving Angela the time to learn and grow, something that Roland isn't the best at doing. Well, that's impressive. You're much stronger than me, he comments. I wouldn't have dreamed of making that choice if I were you. I just can't think in such long terms. Roland only looks at what's directly facing him. With no confirmation that Angela was planning to release the light, he continues to let his anger consume him. He has no trust in Angela that she would do the right thing. This hopelessness is evident in the episode that follows this interaction. But I think I understand now. It's expectations that give us the strength to push through hardship, Tiferet tells Roland after reminiscing on her first life, then elaborates when he questions the specifics. That we can trust things to become better tomorrow. That my life holds possibilities and significance that could make this world a better place. Roland isn't convinced. That's too much optimism for me, he says. Then later, maybe you guys were right about the whole world being on the wane. This world is full of things they can't understand even if they tried, so they just close their eyes. It's going to carry on just fine with one fewer person anyway. Tifrit tries to tell him otherwise, though. But that's not what you're meant to do. You can't keep your eyes shut forever. That's not the humanity I know. Humans constantly try to understand and move towards light, and I'm sure you're no different. She sees Roland's aimlessness and wants to help him find hope in the future. Unfortunately, Roland is far too deep in this pit he's dug for himself, unable to understand the prospect of something to hope for in his life. Look, I don't care what you think about humans, but don't force your generalizations on me. All that's ahead of me was darkness. There wasn't a single glimpse of light. Tifret keeps pushing. It may seem as if there's no light. You may think it's too dark to see anything, but the light is in fact still there. There are many kinds of light, not just one. Once you gain the insight to see those other lights, you don't have to stay curled up in the darkness anymore. Though, it's up to you to approach the light or stay in the darkness. Tifret's words are wise. She reminds him that he is keeping himself in this darkness. He's the one not breaking his own cycle. Conversely, Rowan believes his life is too far gone for any sort of redemption, which is why he continues on this empty plot of revenge in hopes of some sort of fulfillment. I'm just too worn out to walk towards any light. Hell, there's no way I could magically start seeing light that I couldn't my whole life in the first place. Even if I moved forward, there's nothing left for me. I don't have anything I want, either. I don't want to have any more expectations. There's no point in doing that. Not in this city. After this, he begins to break down and resonate with the library just like Angela. Before he embarks on an emotional fight against the librarians, he says, There's no meaning to be found anywhere. Hopes are just empty dreams. Expectations will never get you where you want. Eventually, his breakdown ends the same way Angela's had, with defeat. Roland is embarrassed, but Tifret doesn't shame him and reassures him instead. Every one of us has our own worth and meaning simply by existing, she says. Even for a man like me, who holds zero expectation? I'm sure you do. I'm honestly not very confident even though I speak like I know better. But I still want to have faith. You're free to believe whatever you want, right? To which Roland says, Yep, right you are. Roland has struggled his entire life with expecting anything good to come from the city. Now, he struggles to have any sort of hope in Angela, believing that bloodshed would wait for him at the end of his journey in the library. But, with Tifred's newfound advice, Roland has the insight to hold at least a glimmer of hope towards Angela doing the right thing, no matter how small. The floor that follows Tifred's is Gevora's. Although there's not much to go over, since her episodes primarily focus on her past and her involvement with the Seed of Light project, there's still some important moments to keep in mind. In her third episode, she bonds with Roland over being seasoned fixers who have experienced the worst the city has to offer. Callie's neighbors, who she had been protecting from violence, were no different from the others in that they would resort to violence themselves once they had power, Givera explains. This savage cycle wouldn't stop no matter who she tried to protect. Roland agrees with this sentiment. Sometimes, I feel like there's no point in having any sympathy. I also struggled a lot thinking about what's right and wrong during my early days as a fixer. Both of them have experienced the vicious cycle perpetuated in the city. However, Givura has made an attempt to break out of it, while Roland has long since accepted it as a fact. Roland questions this attitude in her fifth episode, trying to understand how the Sephiroth can have such a different outlook on life compared to himself. Well, do you find yourself miserable right now? He asks. Not really. I do think it's laughable, though, Givura answers. I failed to protect everyone and ended up here like this. Still, I can say for sure that I did my best. 
Givora has long since moved on from her past, a stark contrast to Roland who still can't wrap his head around her being seemingly unbothered by current events. Don't you have a grudge against Angela for bringing you back and forcing you in here? And that she stole the fruit of everything you risked your life to protect, didn't she? She's probably still wondering herself, Givora simply explains. Thinking about everything she went through, I honestly can't blame her for so harshly doing what she did. So I want to reserve my judgment until I've seen for myself the end of the path she's taking. If I unleash my rage at her now, nothing would change. It'll only perpetuate the chain of fury and vengeance. Roland and Givura aren't so dissimilar, as both of them once lived their lives as rage-fueled, destructive fixers. However, the main difference is how Givura has recognized the importance of not feeling the violent cycle of the city. Roland is the complete opposite. He's easily controlled by his emotions and doesn't ever think about the consequences to himself, others, and the city as a whole. You didn't even get to fully protect anything in your lives. How could you move on from that like it was nothing? You always tried, but others would steal from you and take advantage of you. Roland, just like Angela, is selfish. He feels the need to get revenge for everything that has wronged him under the guise of fairness. Wrath has consumed his entire life and has left an empty husk behind. I don't have anyone left, he laments, becoming unstable. There's nothing around me anymore. All that remains is myself, an incompetent and despicable opportunist. I've become a lump of obstinance before I realized it. Nothing more than a hollow life trying to wrap itself in a glossy package. Roland begins to resonate with the library once again. I don't buy it. I bet you're no different. You're just pretending to be cool-headed. I curse this city for taking everything from me, and I loathe myself for letting it happen. There's no way you can humbly be yourself in this damned world. Givura is all too familiar with Roland's surge of emotions, having been through such a state in her time back in the Bonry Corporation. Her advice that follows is a product of the knowledge she's learned from the lives she's lived. Roland, when raging wrath is about to engulf you, you must quench it and forge it into your weapon. You'll learn to temper it soon enough. Soon after, Roland is defeated. Givura approaches him once more with similar wisdom. Roland, I well understand where your anger comes from, but wrath is like a blade with the sharpest edge. If you aren't careful with wielding it, you might end up cutting yourself before you even realize it. So it's important to hold that blade correctly, and the next step would be deciding where to point your sharp blade. She sees how anger has consumed Roland Hull, emphasizing that it's up to him to control himself and not face further consequences. Roland agrees with her words at first, but then adds, Although, I already knew where to point my blade from the start. That's that, and this is this. Roland has pointed his wrath towards everyone and everything that has harmed him. Despite Givora's lesson, he doesn't have any intention to change this. Angela is still a target for his anger, only now, it's less than senseless. Instead of being blinded by rage, he's now blinded by the duty to enact his revenge. Hesed is the next to wake up, following Givora. Being the people person he is, he can easily pick up on Roland's emotions and empathize with him, making it easier for him to talk about his experiences. In their first meeting, Hesed talks about his first life in the Seed of Light project. It was just a shabby laboratory situated in the corner of the outskirts, but for me, it was cozier than any luxurious place within the city could be. And then tragedy suddenly befalls, Roland asks, having heard snippets of the story from Angela. I wouldn't say it was sudden. It slowly seeped in, rather. I can get that, Roland thinks of his own past in comparison. I sometimes think that maybe the tragic event that struck me didn't come out of nowhere after all. I was already getting drenched in it. It was doomed to happen from the beginning. Similarly to his previous chats with the other librarians, his hopeless outlook on life seeps into every conversation he has. To Roland, misfortunes in the city are simply inevitable. There's no point in trying to change them. Things such as Angela's decision in the end is just another thing waiting to go wrong in his life. Roland elaborates on this when he asks Hesed of his thoughts in working in the library. I made the decision to follow her this time around, Hesed answers Roland's question and I can actually minimize the damage my fellow librarians have to suffer if I work hard at it. So all in all, I'm feeling motivated, you see? You've got quite the flexible mindset, huh? Roland comments, surprised at the lack of anger or frustration he holds. Everything's better than before, Hesed reassures him. Maybe this is a mercy of some kind. From who? Our Miss Library Director? Roland asks. It's hard for me to believe, of course, but I sometimes think she might have done this for us. Roland doesn't buy this, though. Uh, I'm not so sure. Angela's goals and where her anger comes from seems pretty clear to me at this point. I don't think there's any mercy in the path she's trying to take. 
At this point, Roland expects Angela to make the selfish choice in the end, coming to terms with the revenge he'd have to carry out once her decision was made. Just as he stated before, he believes some things are just meant to happen from the beginning. This sentiment continues into Hesed's fourth episode. The syndicates in the back streets, the associations of fixers, and the wings, they're all established on the premise of human sacrifice. Hesed comments on the city, to which Roland responds, That's how it is in this world. A big game of cat and mouse where the winner takes all. There's no point in trying to wrap your head around the inevitable. This makes Hesed finally point out Roland's stubbornness. Would you say that the pain and loss you suffered were also inevitable, then? You always talk about the city so plainly, saying that everything happening in it can't be helped. Is it really because you're indifferent about it? Or are you trying to turn away from the underlying unfairness? Ironically, Roland tries to feign his indifference to Hesed's question. Sure, we're just being carried away by a gigantic wave. All we gotta do is surrender to the flow and float down the stream. Hesed doesn't let him easily turn away. You're busy running away, aren't you, Roland? He says, to which he's met with silence. Hesed is right, and Roland doesn't want him to know that. He's running away from the fact that he's sabotaging his own life. It isn't the city forcing his hand. It's Roland's decision to perpetuate the vicious cycle of the city. His indifference is merely a facade for him to not confront this fact. He stubbornly clings to this point of view even as Hesed questions him again in his fifth episode. Think we got what we deserved? Hesed asks him, referring to the failure of their research team. Nah, that's just an obvious outcome, that's all. There's no way the city can change. Really? Even if we learned why all the pain is perpetuated in the city? Hesed continues to prod, getting Roland more frustrated. If anyone actually wanted to know why the city ended up this way, no one would be dying to syndicates just because they didn't cough up some small pocket change in time. No fixers would be driven to death solely to fill out contractual obligations. No feathers would be spent like expendables by the wings. As if knowing why could actually prompt changes. Point is, knowing does jack to change things. I told you, the stream is just too big for individuals to do anything about it. Roland's fury comes from living his entire life in a violent environment. With violence being the answer to solve any conflicts in the back streets, he doesn't even think to consider the possibility of any other option. However, there's one other factor keeping Roland in such a mindset. He believes if it isn't a drastic change, then nothing is worth changing at all. He brushes off Hesed's emphasis on the importance of recognizing the cycle he's perpetuating in the first place. I'm not saying we're looking for immediate change. I know that we can't change things instantly. Hesed acknowledges Roland's concerns, but tries to continue his point. Roland doesn't want to hear it, though. What do you know about it, then? What makes you think you can talk like it's so easy? Everyone just bears with it. They can't afford to do otherwise. When will you stop running away? Hesed asks rather gently. Roland denies this once again, but he doesn't let Roland run from the truth. Aren't you and Angela just lying to yourselves about it, though? That it can't be helped, that there's nothing you could do. Hesed is the first librarian to point out how Angela and Roland are parallels of each other. They both have tricked themselves into believing that the actions they're taking are justified simply because there's no other option. Angela believes that in order to feel complete, she needs to take hundreds of lives, and Roland believes that the darkness in his heart would be healed if he took his revenge on Angela. To them, there's no other option but the extreme because that's just how it always has been. This is why it's so hard for them to even comprehend the possibility of other choices. That's the truth. What else am I supposed to do? This is the city. There is no other option. Nonetheless, Hesed keeps pushing him to come to this realization. Roland, you can't run all the time. I know, Roland snaps, resonating with the library once more. I know that I have to stand this ground and try to make a living like the rest, even if I loathe this cursed world and this city. I can't do anything about it. I can't change this damned city alone. It's just how things work. Knowing the truth or making up my mind won't allow me to go against the flow. No matter how furious I am about the injustice I face, I have to abandon all my pride and just accept it so I can make ends meet. The city won't change. As long as humans exist, the city will never change. It's become a part of everyone's life to hurt others for themselves to live. We can only survive in this world with our sense of shame covered in scabs and calluses. Roland is completely and utterly hopeless. He is both a victim and perpetuator of the city's unchanging suffering. After he takes all of this anger out, though, he approaches Hesed with a defeated sort of melancholy. Yet, Hesed is still there to try and open Roland's eyes. 
Some things just can't be helped, Roland says, to which Hesed starts. Sure, let's say that they were, and there'll still be more things that are inevitable in the future. Maybe we can't change the things that are considered normal right away. Even then, we'll know shame at the very least. Simply knowing shame in the society we're part of will change a lot of things. Just by knowing? There's no strength to get things done. Roland's pessimism persists, but Hesed snaps him out of it. Roland, the fact that one knows is sufficient. It might get shelved deep in the back of the mind because life keeps you busy, but it can always be pulled back into the light, as long as you have the will. And when you bring it back up, it doesn't have to be the only one time. If you can do it time and time again, neither you nor the city, no one can look down on the power it can create. This whole time, Roland has been afraid to even confront the shame from the atrocities he has committed in his past. As Hesed has stated time and time again, he has been running away his whole life, not even wanting to acknowledge the consequences of his actions. But now, he's forcing Roland to look back, promising him that merely recognizing the pain he's enabling is the first key to changing the city bit by bit. Shame, huh? He says. The humiliation that I took part in perpetuating the pain of the city. I get what you're trying to say. I admit it. Yeah, it's certainly true. Most aren't even aware of what they're doing. Finally, after their constant back and forthing, Hesed has made a crack in Roland. He's laid out Roland's biggest insecurity and forced him to realize it, which makes him finally understand the point he was trying to make this whole time. By acknowledging the cause of the suffering in the city rather than turning a blind eye, making a change is possible. Finally, the last and most important librarian to wake up is Bina. Bina's involvement in Roland's development is crucial, much like Hakma's in Angela's story. Being a former Arbiter of the Head, she can see directly through Roland's facade and judge the real person he is on the inside. This is demonstrated in their very first meeting where she asks, What is the library like from what you have seen? Roland's unsure, so Bina elaborates for him. Is it a place of death, nourishing its thirst with blood? Is it a spire of knowledge, accumulating all sorts of information? Or is it perhaps an ark, sailing for a new life? Finally, Roland has an answer. Hmm, the library I've seen was like… an arena, maybe? Angela, the librarians, and the others are all fighting to earn what they want, so it's really fierce and bloody, all in all. Satisfied with this answer, Bina then flips the question. What kind of place is the library to you, then? Well, for me, it's just a jail, he answers simply. That does not appear to be true. You are in fact looking to seize an opportunity. Roland plays dumb, saying the opportunity he's seeking is merely his own freedom. If that is what you say, Bina says, then leaves it at that. She knows exactly what Roland has come here for, seeing through any lie he tries to make. The library isn't a jail. The library is an opportunity for him to enact his revenge. In the following episode, Roland learns of her former status as an Arbiter, leaving him with several questions. One of these questions is in regards to her compliance with Angela's plan despite once being at the top of the city. I simply take care of the tasks given to me. No more, no less, she answers, but Roland isn't satisfied. What if Angela ordered you to tell her all about the secrets of the city only the head knows then? She has not made such an attempt, possibly because she knows that I will not answer regardless, Bina explains, unbothered. No, perhaps she already tried to uncover my secrets before I could realize it. And what if I tried to kill you and turn you into a book, here and now, Rowan threatens, so I can pull out every little bit of knowledge you have by force? She's amused by this threat, seeing how Rowan has unknowingly shown her a genuine side of his personality. You are a bold individual and quite hostile as well, she says. That is what differentiates you from us, perhaps. Later, she begins to speak on her impression of Ion in her first life, comparing it to Roland and Angela's own personal turmoil. There was once a man whose dream had been ruined by me. However, even when he faced me in person, his anger was directed at what was above and beyond. His gaze never settled on the things right in front of him. He always looked further. Unlike you or Angela, who are well nigh blind to anything outside of your immediate sight as I can see. Just like Hesed, Bina points out how Roland and Angela struggle with the same shallow view of the world, only caring about immediate results rather than long-term consequences. Like she says, only a few sentences later, You bear a poison, heavy and slow, yet deadly. I know you well, even though you know nothing about me. 
She knows that the vicious cycle consuming Roland will eventually kill him if he doesn't make a change. Therefore, she challenges this philosophy of his in the following episode. Your words suggest that you have let go of many things, she points out, to which Roland disagrees. I was robbed of them against my will, more like. I got caught up in events I couldn't even understand and lost everything I had. Do you believe the city is responsible for it? Bina asks. You appear to be under the impression that the city stole your ordinary and humble happiness. Yep, I am. Or maybe I just accepted that there's nothing I can do about it and gave up, Roland answers. This world just won't let me have anything I want. It always finds a way to make me suffer for it. This belief has no solid foundation, yet has controlled every aspect of Roland's life. This is why Bina challenges it. Have you never inflicted pain upon others or taken everything from them, then? Roland says yes, then quickly tries to justify it before Bina cuts him off. That's that, and this is this. I see you are resorting to your favorite justification. Does it hold true, however? Do you think that the boundaries between what concerns you or not could be defined so conveniently? Well, obviously, Roland says, the pain I suffered is mine to care, and the pain others suffer is their own business. Bina finds this nonchalance interesting. Such a carefree statement you are making. You know better than anyone, yet you refuse to face it more adamantly than most others. It is not that you cannot see the suffering of others. You are merely turning a blind eye to it. That is what makes the denizens of the city so vulnerable. Their own anguish is the most tangible. They believe it matters more than anyone else's. However, they know deep down that their belief is untrue. The city is built on human greed and selfishness. Everyone turns away from the suffering of others as human compassion is a foreign concept. Roland is a prime example for how this mentality can destroy oneself. By only seeing his own suffering, he has completely disregarded the pain he has caused others, contributing to the very cycle that has caused him such agony. When someone harms him, it is their fault. When Roland harms others, it is merely the fault of the city's unchanging need for violence. Bina brings Roland's worldview up once more in the episode that follows, saying, Epoche, perceive me as who I am. Do not make any ancillary judgments. Do not be bound by anything you have learned in your life. Roland tries to object to this, but Bina continues. Regard me as what I simply am, neither as an arbiter nor a sephira. Consider only the time I have gone through. You may be able to see it when you observe me as though you knew nothing. Bina compares Roland's refusal to see anything other than an arbiter before him to his refusal to see anything in another's perspective. A clear vision can only be attained through one's own eyes, she continues, to which Roland adds, so, you basically mean everyone ought to look at the world from their own perspective and think what they want? People can see the same cup of water in different ways, like half empty or half full or some shit? Use your own eyes to watch things as they are, Bina explains. Then, you may see it. However, you will inevitably forget why you wish to see it once you reach that point. That oblivion is what creates anguish. That is why it is a tragedy. Bina explains that this self-centered perspective is the very thing that leads to the anguish perpetuated every day in the city. Because everyone is caring for themselves, nobody bothers to even take notice of the suffering of others. When Roland tries to deny this, saying everything is predetermined in the city, Bina simply says, Perhaps. Peek into your own universe, as everyone else shall. Roland doesn't even think different perspectives are a possibility. To him, his reality is the true reality. Such tragedies are only a matter of what the city chooses for people. But such nuance and differences in view are very real, which is what Bina emphasizes in her second to last episode. She begins to talk about Ian's past in relation to Angela, then compares it to how some still thought of him highly. He was a beacon of virtue for some, she says. There's no such thing as good in this world, however. There is only what is perceived as such. It is not up to the individual to dare make the universal judgment. Then, after Roland agrees with her words, she points out Roland's most fatal flaw. Humans are bound to view the world while carrying certain things on their backs. You are no exception, of course. Roland's view of the world is based purely on the loss he has endured. Everyone he meets is tainted by this loss he has felt, seeing them as merely another person waiting to harm him. To Roland, suffering at the hands of others is a constant truth in the city that will never change. This is why it is so hard for him to hold even the smallest semblance of hope towards Angela, believing that in the end, she'll just go her own selfish way. However, this fight is making him confront this. 
Once it is over, Rowan's fighting spirit is broken and he is the most vulnerable he has ever been to Bina. I'm scared, he says. I'm afraid of what decision I might make in the end. I don't know how great that guy you've been watching was, but I'm just a nobody. I'm nothing more than a speck of rust on the gears of this world. I was just one of the many foul people partaking in this vile world. That's why I'm so afraid. His entire life, Roland has lived as a coward, not once confronting the motivations behind his actions. Now, he finally sees the truth. It is here where he is the most similar to Angela, the both of them are afraid of what awaits them at the end of this journey. Angela wants humanity, Roland wants revenge, but the both of them have realized that in chasing after these goals, they have sped the ever-running treadwheel of suffering in the city. I've turned away from lots of things, saying, that's that and this is this, Roland continues, repenting his actions. We ran from reality, and my wife and I got what's coming to us. It's ultimately no one's fault that things went south. I guess I'm partly responsible for it, too. I'm paying my price for remaining a bystander in this city. Perhaps you are right, Bina says in response. Then, Roland asks her for guidance relating to the one decision he's the most afraid to make. But... Even if I didn't look away, could I have stopped this massive cycle alone? To this, she answers, everything shall repeat. We managed to break the cycle one time, yet us librarians are now going through another repetition. What truly matters, however, is that the cycle did break at least once. Whether it be from living in a broken city to carrying the sins of one's father, the pathway to recovering from abuse is never linear. Bina mentions this, referencing that despite how Angela broke the Sephiroth out of their personal hell, they've backtracked and continued to take lives in the library much like their facility had done. However, she puts emphasis on how they managed to break the cycle once. This means it is possible. The city's cycle of agony Roland once thought of as inescapable was fully able to be broken out of. It's just up to the city's residents, including himself, to make that decision. His resolve to do so would soon be tested in the final chapter to close out the game, Impuritas Kiwitatis. Now that Roland and Angela have had their own developments, it's now time for them to be together again once more. The chapter opens up with Angela approaching Roland, talking to him about how excited she is about her once perfect memories beginning to fade away. I've never seen you looking so happy before, Roland comments, still unsure about the path she's planning to take. What do you think of the city and its people that are breaking down because of the distortion, though? That, I can't quite receive with a smile, she says. Still, the despicable man who had locked me up for one million years would fall to despair if he saw what's happening now. Yes, he'll endlessly despair. His idiotic and flawed plan caused more people to wallow in agony. He's going to pay his price in full soon enough. Angela's newfound remorse for causing more suffering in the city is usurped by the fact that she's on the cusp of revenge against her father. She's reminded herself of the reason she embarked on this journey in the first place, trying to put all of her inner conflict aside in hopes of enjoying this moment. Roland can't believe this. So you just want to feel the joy of vengeance, whatever the consequences of your actions might be, he asks, to which Angela replies, That's what I must do. I was forced to witness countless deaths while reciting a script like a promptress. Such things are all I could watch and learn. I have to do what I can do well. It's the only thing I know how to do, even though it's not enjoyable to see the city and its people suffer because of me, I still have to be happy. I'm obliged to. It's what I've been waiting for. Until now. If I don't do this, I won't be compensated for the millions of years of lone suffering. Nowhere else would I be repaid. I still long for vengeance. However, Angela goes silent for a moment. In this one conversation, her inner conflict has been made clear. All she wants is some sort of compensation for the trauma that was inflicted on her. Since violence and bloodshed was all that she was raised on, Angela has come to the conclusion that perpetuating such violence would be the key for her to overcome her past. This comes in direct conflict with what she's learned about the city and how she's affecting its residents. Instead of happily taking lives as she had done in the early days of the library, Angela trudges down this path with hesitation and regret. She just wants to feel that solace Carmen had promised her all that time ago. She just wants to feel at peace for once in her life. In her eyes, this is the only means to reach this peace, as much as she doesn't like it. Just as Angela said, she does her best to be happy out of mere obligation, for if she wasn't content in the end, everything she had done would be for nothing. Yet, there's another side of this conversation, Rowan's unfathomable rage. Blinded by his anger, he cannot see Angela's inner conflict. All he can focus on is how she has chosen to continue with her plan in the end, despite all of the chances he has given her. 
It is this moment where he completely loses what little faith he had in Angela. Unbeknownst to her, Roland has made up his mind. He would have to kill Angela at the end of all this. Putting this scheme aside though, he remains as inconspicuous as he always has, receiving the last few guests they would need to fully gather the light. As the library has risen to an impurity, the Hannah Association has taken notice and begun to send their fixers. The first reception goes smoothly, however, there's one oddity. Among the fixers to be sent to the library is Olivier, Roland's old friend. Yet, he merely stays to shake Angela's hand, then leaves before the reception can begin. This puzzles Angela, but she doesn't think much of it until the following reception. When Angela goes to receive the new guest, she's caught by surprise when Olivier immediately attempts to kill her. What is the meaning of this? You should be more careful when your body is made of flesh rather than metal, but it seems you can't die from having your head chopped off yet," Olivier simply explains. Angela acknowledges this, not expecting what Olivier is about to try next. There's still an abundance of options that don't involve killing, he says calmly, before stabbing Angela with a small handheld device. With the power of the library's protection weakened, Angela cannot properly defend herself. For the first time ever, she's afraid for her life. The safety net she's had all this time has been suddenly ripped away beneath her feet. A workshop-crafted assassination device with T-Corp's singularity applied to it, bought just for you. Olivier elaborates, You may have power, but you're certainly gullible. Olivier is right. Without the safety of her own library, Angela is completely defenseless. Her inexperience has become her biggest weakness. However, before Olivier can activate the device and effectively torture Angela in the span of a second, Roland interferes. After a bit of back and forth, Angela gratefully leaves, leaving the two alone. Roland, is this what your big plan was all about? Is this really worth it? Olivier asks. What you're doing isn't any different from all the tragedies we've seen and gone through. You've been perpetuating it in the library with that machine. Although many of the librarians have similarly warned Roland of this, this advice means the most coming from Olivier who knows him the best out of everyone. Despite this, Roland doesn't listen to him. I won't expect you to understand me, he merely says, preparing to duel his old friend. However, it becomes evident that their relationship hasn't dwindled despite the circumstances they're in now. Olivier begins to talk about how much he worried about Roland after his disappearance, and Roland later brings up fond memories they had shared together. Unfortunately, they can't put aside what they're both here to do at this moment. You know we can't go back to those times anymore, Roland, Olivier explains. You swallowed your anger and sadness to work with that machine, so I don't doubt that you've prepared yourself for a lot of things. I know, Roland says, saying what he knows is his last goodbye. Both of us have gone too far down our roads. It was nice talking to you after a long while, though, Olivier. I'm only doing my job as a fixer of the Hannah Association now, to retrieve the books of my colleagues and dispatch threats. That's that, and this is this, isn't that right? Right you are. That's that, and this is this. Let us begin. This reception concludes with Olivier's death by Roland's own hands. He has nothing to say about it to Angela when she asks afterwards. And you just lost your friend. Are you feeling okay? Roland merely responds, that's that, and this is this, knowing exactly what he would have to do next. Before Roland can take action against Angela, the reverberation ensemble breaks into the library uninvited with a goal of stealing all the light Angela has hoarded so far. The conversation initially revolves around their plan to take over the library. Then, Argalia begins to toy with Roland, making him furious. After showing him a crude reconstruction of Angelica's body, one of the members of the ensemble brings up the piano. The piano? Angela asks, shocked. Argalia jumps on this opportunity. What? Oh <laughs> my oh my, was it too early to reveal this? Oh, I'm so sorry, Roland. I didn't ruin your little plan by accident, did I? Roland goes completely silent. Is this about the pianist? Angela asks again, still left in the dark. The entire ensemble bursts into laughter, Argalia included. <laughs> uh, I was trying to hold it in, I really was. But this is too hysterical, I can't hold back my tears. You naive, moronic heap of scrap, Angela. You're the one that killed that black-hearted bastard's undeserved better half. Do you see it now? You're the one who killed my sister. The other members of the ensemble begin to chime in. Quite a scene indeed. Even I cannot help but laugh at this. The white nights and dark days caused the distortion phenomenon, which made the pianist. And you, Angela, are responsible for the white nights and dark days. The relation couldn't be any clearer. Poor Miss Angela, 
How can you be still so blind to the truth? Angela goes completely silent while Roland tries to shut the ensemble up. Now, she's learned that not only has she harmed hundreds of city residents, she's completely ruined the life of the one person she would consider to be her friend. The pain that has consumed him whole was all because of her little tantrum she threw. Unfortunately, with her inexperience, Angela doesn't know of the implications of such a betrayal in their relationship. When Roland's rage boils over right in front of Angela, she becomes afraid. Roland, calm down, she attempts, to which he's met with silence. What's the matter? This isn't like you. She's never seen this genuine side of him before, which Roland mocks. Not like me, huh? You've got the wrong impression, then. Before they can talk further, the reverberation ensemble becomes a more pressing matter. However, they share one last moment before receiving them. Roland? Angela says weakly, not knowing what to say, but Roland won't even listen to her. Don't say a word. We still have a common goal of stopping our Gallia. Angela doesn't try to pursue a conversation, knowing the damage she had done was far too severe for her to fathom. If Argalia hadn't exposed the fact that Angela was responsible for Angelica's death, Roland would have caught her by surprise and killed her before she could even make this connection. Now, Roland's ugly motivations have come to light, and Angela is struggling to grapple with this. She doesn't even know what to expect, only able to focus on this common goal they have before everything falls apart. After a lengthy battle with the Reverberation Ensemble, the two stand before each other at the climax of Angela's plan. Congrats, Angela. It's finally over. You've got a human body, so you don't have to live as a machine anymore, right? Indeed. I am free now. All of the light has been reclaimed. I have gained a perfect human body and freedom. I've made it with your help. Thank you, Roland. Angela says, foolishly believing Roland will let her go through with her plan. All I need to do now is take my book from the light. Roland doesn't let this happen, having long since prepared for this very moment. All right, guess it's time for me to finish this too, he says. Angela, you can guess what I'm about to do now, yeah? Right after this threat, the most important reception of the entire game takes place. The reception of Roland, the Black Silence. So it was no coincidence that you came to the library, Roland, Angela says. You bet. The series of events leading up to this moment was the biggest gamble of my life, Roland answers her, barely restraining his anger. I see. You helped me attain my freedom, but it wasn't for my sake. You just used me like a tool. Angela is heartbroken. The one man she had trusted so deeply, thought of so dearly, was no better than her father in the end. The one friend she had thought she had made, it was all a lie. Roland doesn't let Angela believe she's faultless, though. Come on, don't talk like you got nothing out of me. I never slacked off, you know? I gave it my all to support you until you reached your goal. It's mutual exploitation, at the very least. Did you get the result you wanted? Angela asks, still processing the utter shock of this betrayal. Well, I got enough. The reason I'd come to the library was to figure out the cause of the phenomenon that created the distortions like the pianist, and to find out who was responsible for it. As such, all obvious signs point to you, Angela. None of this would have happened if you hadn't thrown a tantrum in your last moment. Why didn't you try to stop or kill me right away then? Angela is still begging for some semblance of an answer of why Roland has chosen to hurt her so. First off, you were simply unkillable when I first met you, Roland replies. Second, I wanted to know why you made the choice you did. Third, I thought that maybe you could make a different decision that I couldn't. And fourth, to bring you the greatest loss, the greatest suffering, at the very end of it all. Roland tried to give her a chance to break the cycle of violence that he didn't have the courage to break himself. However, upon seeing her decision to continue with her original plan, all sympathy he once held for Angela had become meaningless. Right now, you're completely human. You can feel pain as its whole and experience death. I learned here that you went through your own fair share of torment, frustration, and loss. I can understand why you made the choices you made. And seeing you start to contemplate your aim as time went by, I thought that maybe there was room for another option. That maybe, just maybe, you might choose a different answer. And if you somehow did by that smallest chance, then I might have been able to find a different solution myself. But in the end, you didn't. Sure, the pain I went through may be a speck of dust compared to your million years of despair, but so what? That day, I swore to myself before that damned piano. 
I swore that I'd make the city experience the same sorrow of loss, of the frustration that I felt when it took my world away from me, the same as you. Angela is speechless, not knowing what to do or what to say. Then, who will pay for the misery I went through? There was nothing else I could do. All I knew was to make them suffer the same pain. Angela doesn't want to pass up the only opportunity she has to have someone suffer for her trauma. She doesn't know any other alternative, which is why she's trying so desperately to move past this and conclude her ending. You're asking me for an answer, Roland says. If I knew the way, and if I could choose it, I wouldn't have done this drivel. I do know one thing for sure. This is what happens when you try to wash blood with blood. Roland's words are the truth. They are nothing but two broken people trying to find their answers in harming each other. Angela isn't ready to accept this fact, but Roland is more than ready to enact his revenge. Angela, you have to feel the same sorrow as mine. No, you have to feel even worse than that. You took Angelica from me. She meant the world to me. I sat on my hands as I watched the people I knew die, and I even killed my old friend with these shadowed gloves just for this moment. All for this very moment, I've been suppressing my emotions, forcing a pained smile. Even after he threatens Angela's torture and eventual death, all Angela can focus on is the fact that Roland is crying in front of her. Seeing you shed tears is an unfamiliar sight, she says gently, realizing that it is because of her own actions that her dearest friend is in such a state. I'm done with the facade now, Roland continues through angry tears, rage consuming him whole. I'll do everything I can, in ways beyond your imagination, to give you the most painful death possible. And I'll do it right before you take the final step to your freedom. I'll rob you of everything. You'll reap the whirlwind for what you've sown. At this moment, Angela cannot hear any of these threats. She's in far too much shock to process them, her now human brain shutting out Roland's words to protect herself. I only want to be compensated for my suffering. Angela manages to get out, sounding much like the scared, immature child she is at heart. Roland is quick to jump on this. What's this now? You're acting weak all of a sudden? Are you finally starting to hesitate when it's almost over? Nah, can't be. You've got power and knowledge, and now a proper life as a living being on top of it. You just don't want to give up what you finally took hold of. Roland tells Angela that there's no turning back now. She has to follow through with the atrocities she had committed up to this point. At least I used a method that isn't forceful. Angela tries to reassure herself, but is quickly cut off. You used the same logic as when you'd stolen the light. You used it to kill those who came to the library in the name of Fair Price. You didn't even stop to think about the consequences of your actions. That's how you've always been. You don't give two shits about anyone other than yourself. Roland, as much as Angela doesn't want to believe, is completely right. The library has been solely driven by her own selfishness as much as she's tried to convince herself otherwise. It is only now that she's being confronted with the consequences of everything she has done for the sake of her own freedom. Yet, Roland knows that he's being hypocritical. In fact, he accepts such selfishness as merely an inevitability. I don't blame you, though. I just can't. It's how the city works. That's that, and this is this. That's why I'm going to kill you strictly with the mindset of the city folk. What I need to do is kill you and take my revenge. What you need to do is kill me and get the freedom you want. We just need to have a simple, raw state of mind as we fight each other. So I want you to stop getting any funny little ideas and stick to your desire for freedom and vengeance. Roland has fully surrendered himself to the city's vicious cycle and is forcing Angela to do the same. In the end, they're just two selfish residents of the city, and they must fight according to its rules. The cycle can never be broken. The answers the both of them seek can only be answered with the death of the other. However, this philosophy is put to the test when Roland is finally defeated after a lengthy, hard-fought battle. A dim-witted egoist whose sight is limited by their own selfishness. A proper fool chasing after immediate results, he says, on the brink of death. That's who you are, and who I am. The same logic that dictates us was bound to be our downfall one day. If we really cared for ourselves, neither of us should have made this choice. It won't last long that way. Being selfish isn't about keeping an eye on yourself and nothing else. We had to take a good look at the things around us and engrave them in our hearts. Everything is interlinked, after all. Roland finally sees how their worst flaws are reflected in the other. Angela's selfishness and greed, Roland's rage and inability to let go of the past, their worst traits have complemented each other and led them to this very moment. But at this very moment, 
Angela hesitates. Roland waits for her to kill him and end this once and for all, but she can't. Not after everything she's seen. Not after everything she's learned. Finally, she comes to a realization. She can't do this anymore. Roland, I'm going to let go. Someone has to break the cycle, ultimately. After all, even I couldn't escape the treadwheel turning for the city. And if I have to be entrapped in more of such cycles, perpetrating deeds similar to what I've done, I... I don't think I could live that life further. I would continue to be crushed under the ever-turning wheel. The only difference would be how harshly it smothers me. Achieving freedom was meaningless in a world like this. Despite everything she has been through up until this point, millions of years of agony, watching those dear to her die over and over again, and being forced to play the role of an abuser, Angela has come to realize that this wasn't the answer. If she kills Roland and continues with her plan, she would be no better than her father that made her this way. She has to break this cycle of abuse before she lets it consume her. However, Roland is still swallowed up by the very vicious cycle Angela is trying to break free of. He doesn't understand why she's making this decision. What? After all the mess you've caused, you're gonna let go? Now? Were you struck by some huge revelation or something? What about all the people who faced an unavoidable death in this damned library? All those people I've killed, what will become of them? What was my determination and my despair for? These sacrifices I've made? You have to want something, damn it! You can't break it off so easily, you've come too far for that. Someone who doesn't even have a full-fledged desire has no right to take so much blood and power. Roland can't comprehend Angela's change of heart, comparing it to how far they had come into this plan. Yet, not even Angela herself can answer why it took her so long to realize how harmful her plan was. All she knows is how much her guilt consumes her. I feel their weight now, and it's too much for me to bear. I thought this would be the last time. I sincerely mean it. If I shut my eyes again and shed blood one last time, I thought I would be free to live as I want. Alas, I could never be truly free as long as I was chained to the bonds of the city. You, I, and this library are soaked in the blood of many. All the actions I took in pursuit of my freedom only sped the treadwheel. I convinced myself that it was an inevitable sacrifice I had to put up with, for the sake of my freedom and amends for my agony. And once this was over, I wanted to stop taking precious things from anyone. Just like Roland, Angela had convinced herself that the suffering of others was necessary in order to reach what she needed the most. However, she hated herself every step of the way. The regret and guilt Angela has built up over her journey is now overflowing. I know what loss and pain are, how they feel, she continues. If I have to snuff out what belongs to me with my own hand in the end, and if life requires me to spill the blood of others, or lets my own blood so that I may live on, I'd much rather remove my grip on this goal. At the very least, I refuse to die under the wheel. You can't just undo what you've done, Roland argues, furious. You extort from others once, and you have to keep doing it. What were you going to do if you lacked the resolve to commit even that? The books, the librarians, the library, and finally, my own freedom. I'll let go of them all first, Angela explains, having come to terms with having to lose everything. I will no longer cling to them. I won't try to keep them in my clutch anymore. If I give it all up, then I can reverse this. At least, those who died in the library can be brought back. Is that the answer you chose? Roland asks, shocked. When you can just walk out of this place and go wherever you want to go? When the exit from this prison is finally open? For one million years, you've been waiting for the day when you could exact your revenge. And still, you can make that choice? Even when the thing you've desperately wished for is just ahead of you? He doesn't understand. They're twisted parallels of each other, trying to heal their trauma through violent means. And yet Angela has managed to free herself from this vicious cycle that has plagued the both of them. The cycle that Roland had thought he could never break himself. Yes, Angela merely agrees. I made this decision by the dint of my own will entirely. This will be the first wish and the last choice I make, since I've become free from all restraints for the first time. This doesn't satisfy Roland's rage. That still won't make me forgive you. I'm not supposed to forgive you. You can't just let go of stuff on your own. That's not how it works in the city. It's selfish to do that. Roland still doesn't understand. 
why Angela has chosen to do this, how Angela got this resolve to break herself free of the abuse that had controlled her life much like Roland's trauma does, it's all an enigma to him. However, Angela gives him the answer to these questions in the form of an opportunity. An opportunity to follow after her. An opportunity to be free of his own cycle of abuse once and for all. Let me ask you one favor, she says. I'm going to leave myself vulnerable for a short while. Expelling everything I've absorbed until now won't be a simple feat. Could you leave me be while I do that? Roland is silent, the choice now presenting itself to him. I'm asking you as a dear friend, if you still consider me a friend, that is. You do know I can just kill you in the meantime instead, right? Roland points out, not comprehending how Angela can put so much trust in him despite everything that has happened. I won't stop you, but don't worry, she explains, accepting her fate. When I'm done, everything will go back to the way it was. I'll disappear without a trace. Angela has found peace in the fact that the city will simply be better off without her. Whether her death will be a result of her fizzling into the light or at the hands of Roland himself, she doesn't mind. In fact, she's found peace with these outcomes. Not only is this a means of repenting for the destruction she inflicted on the city, she's doing the least she can for ruining the life of her first and only friend. For if he hated her as much as he had said, her own death would be the least she could do for him. She has given Roland everything he needs to enact his revenge, bearing her neck and accepting her fate. How could you lay down your own goals, Roland says, at a loss for words. How can you cut it off before anyone else? Seeing Angela in such a state has sparked something inside him. It is possible. This whole time, breaking free of the cycle was possible. Just as Bina said, the cycle was broken once. It was now Roland's turn to do so, with Angela by his side. After swallowing his agony, regret, trauma, and sorrow, Roland chooses to follow after her. He would no longer let the city's cycle of violence control him. He will defend Angela until his dying breath. Brightness illuminates the city once more as Angela becomes one with the light. She looks upon the city she's known for such a short while with a bittersweet finality, understanding the darkness that awaits her at the end of this process. The colossal, towering tree of light bursts into bloom once again, flooding the city of gray with its warmth, she narrates. The light that has swaddled the city will permeate the people's hearts, allowing them to finally face the emotions they had long forgotten. However, those seeds won't bear fruit immediately. They won't sprout at the same time. They will slowly poke through the soil, and they will shroud the city in a wave of change that everyone will notice in time. They'll be given an opportunity to face their true feelings and express them. Sadly, I won't be able to see that myself. Now I understand what you lot meant when you wished you could be there to see the fruit of your labors. However, as soon as Angela comes to terms with her eventual death, she can feel another presence in the light with her. Then, someone speaks. Are you really gonna be all right with letting all of it go now? What's going on? You are... Angela calls into the light, afraid. The presence reveals itself, bearing the image of Angela's past self. However, this isn't just a reflection of Angela's past. This is her mother, Carmen, trying to tempt her once more. She reminds her of her selfish desires and how far she's come, speaking to Angela through a face she can recognize. Relax. The light is being spread just fine, she comforts her. I just arranged a little room for a brief chat. It'll only take a moment. Time doesn't matter much here, after all. What do you have to tell me at this point? Angela asks. To think that I would let go of my one wish that I've held for a million years. That single wish meant for myself? Carmen continues to tempt her. That won't do. It's time for me to claim the freedom for which I've yearned. The path I've been seeking has finally opened. However, Angela won't succumb to this as easily as she had before. It's my first choice I made out of my free will. This is the path I decided to take entirely of my own volition. The emotions festering deep inside me, let's have them blossom again, together. It's not impossible to do, Carmen continues, then lets the disguise slip for a moment. I know you well. I've always been watching right by your side, closer than any other. After this, Carmen confronts her in a final realization. The last step Angela would have to take is to finally come to terms with her past and break free of Carmen's grasp. 
Unfortunately, she stays strong in her resolve and pushes through, not falling for her temptations. At the end of this fight, Carmen approaches her once again, no longer bearing her disguise. You were created to resemble me and expected to think like me, but here we are. It seems our paths will diverge from now on. I'll continue to go my way, and I hope you'll be able to stay on yours. Are you sure you won't stop what you're doing? Angela asks, referring to the distortion phenomenon. Not until the city folk will learn to look at their true selves and love themselves for who they are, at least. Carmen answers with no shame. I see. I suppose our paths won't ever be the same again. Then, after a pause, Carmen, as long as I'm part of this light, I'll do everything in my power to stop you. Angela has fully committed to her repentance, doing everything to fight against the one woman that had tied her in such a knot. There's no turning back. The light is nearing its end. The light shall soar upwards ceaselessly, Angela says as she looks upon the city one last time, as if to represent the hope that every person in the city will be able to move ahead without being swayed. Those who fell in the library will begin to open their eyes and find themselves in the places they belong, one by one. However, some time along the way, a different presence had made itself clear in the light. I'm not sure when, but I'd clearly heard something in the light. Those words come back to me now. Angela then remembers what the voice had said, what Ian's voice had said. I'm sorry, her father had told her, then pausing before he spoke again, and good job. Being in the light, Ian has been watching his daughter change and grow since the beginning. He's seen how his abuse has destroyed her. He's seen the justified rage build inside of her, leading to her sabotage after the conclusion of the play. But, most importantly, he's seen Angela's decision in the end. He knows that no words will ever make up for the horrific things he had put his daughter through, but at the very least, he wants Angela to know one thing. He's proud of her. He's proud of her for breaking the cycle he couldn't all those years ago. He's proud of her for being the one to make a change despite everything he has done to wrong her. With these final words spoken to her by her father, Angela is finally at peace with herself, having come to terms with her traumatic past. Turning to the last page, I ponder. Angela can feel herself fading as the last bit of the light fizzles out. I, it's finally her time. In a few seconds, she's going to die, but she'll die with peace knowing the city has been left better without her. As soon as she's ready to disappear, everything goes silent. Someone takes her hand, then pulls. It's suddenly much louder. Angela has been wrenched back into the real world at the last second by none other than Roland himself. How? No, this can't be. I'm not supposed to remain. She's disoriented by her sudden change of surroundings. Roland is quick to catch her up, though, even amidst his third fight with Argalia after they were released from the light. Yo, Angela, good to see you again after so long. Guess you had to return to a mechanical body, huh? Your face is all pale again. Angela is still in shock. Roland, what have you done? You almost evaporated on the last day, so I pulled you out of the pillar of light. Just a quick sec, I'm still not done dealing with that persistent sicko over there. You should not have done that. Angela says, already fearing the consequences of this. I won't be able to revert everything completely this way. Angela's concerns aren't heard though, as Roland is much more occupied with finally killing Argalia. Once he's dead, the two of them are left alone, finally at the end of the new paths they have carved out for each other. You said the people who've turned into books in the library are gonna come back, right? Roland asks. But so far, the only ones to revive were the Blue Reverb and his cronies. They'll regain consciousness to find themselves lying somewhere in the city, as if waking up from a long slumber, Angela explains. There wouldn't have been any uncertainty had you not intervened at the last moment. Thanks to you, I have no idea when or where the people will reawake. So they're still coming back anyway, yeah? Roland asks, unbothered by Angela's criticisms. That's a relief. I had a feeling this would work out. Why did you do such a thing if you weren't even certain? She asks, still not knowing why Roland chose to pull her out of the light in the first place. As far as she knows, he still holds a grudge against her for her actions. Doesn't hurt to do something I actually want for the sake of myself, he explains simply. I got sick of weighing profits my whole life. You still have something you're hiding from me, don't you? Angela asks, doubtful that this was the full story. Uh, the purple tear told me one thing before I made the jump here. When you get in there, it'll be nice in several ways to do what you want without letting anything hold you back at the end, kid. Seeing you slowly vanish in the light, her words hit me. 
Roland allowed himself one last selfish decision to bring Angela back. He didn't want to lose her, not after losing his friends, not after losing his family. He couldn't let one more person slip out of his grasp, one more person that he genuinely loves. In the end, he did what he wanted to do without anyone holding him back, whether that be his own reservations towards Angela or his lingering trauma, just as the Purple Tear had advised him. Later, he picks up a familiar piece of paper and hands it to Angela. Here, you dropped this. It's the list of wishes I wrote. I don't think I can accomplish half of the things written here with a body like this, though. Well, that's something we gotta start figuring out from now on, Rwanda reassures her. There probably won't be one absolute answer or whatever. There are as many people as there are stars out there, all intertwined with one another. And every one of them has a different story, a different answer to tell. Soon after, the final ordeal faces them and the librarians. The head of the city has come to expel the library. This structure in its entirety will be driven out and relocated to the outskirts, Zena explains with certainty. The library has already become an impurity of the city. We couldn't stand by any longer. Are you disturbed by its powers? She asks. Not quite. The sole reason is you, Angela. An entity that isn't human entertained thoughts that only a human should have. You poor machine. No matter how much you contemplate and enrich your mind, you cannot become human if you aren't born as one. When I thought you might turn into a human at the end, you let go of all you had during that critical moment. Had you fully become a human at the culmination of the ordeal, the city would have been more willing to accept you. Alas. Had she been any younger, Angela would have likely crumbled under these words. Now, however, she faces them directly with no sense of fear or shame. I don't care if I have to stay as a machine, she says. A machine with a heart has no place in the city, Zena insists. You cannot break free from your origin which defines you. Why does that matter? I'm the only one who has a say in defining my identity. I don't need any flimsy husk to do it for me. Angela doesn't crack, staying firm. How contemptible that your line of thought is so dangerously close to what a human must aspire to reach, Zena says, unintentionally confirming how human Angela truly is. You're further demonstrating why we cannot let you be. Later, Angela, the machine with the mind of a human, the door mustn't be closed because of something like you. If I'm understanding this right, you wish to put me to death and kick the library out into the outskirts, is that correct? Angela asks, to which Zena confirms. I exist in this place as myself, standing on my two feet with my own strength. I have no problem brushing off the bullshit you're spewing on my doorstep. Angela continues to hold strong, not afraid anymore. She has come to accept that there will always be those who despise her for her status of humanity. The only thing that matters to Angela is the safety of those who believe otherwise. It is this very resolve that makes Roland and the librarians fight until the very end. Eventually, this fight ends in the library's expulsion to the outskirts, despite the best effort of the librarians. However, given they hadn't lost any lives, this is an ending Angela's content with. With Roland by her side, she walks with him to the highest point of the library, overlooking the barren wasteland that has become their new home. I guess that's how it is here. Now, what to do? Roland asks. I plan to live on, and I plan to change, Angela answers. Change what? Well, my vengeance hasn't ceased entirely. I'm still eager to see it through. I'll continue to write books and reopen the library at some point. It likely won't resume immediately, though. Really? Roland exclaims, unsure. Before anything else, I've decided to change course, Angela adds. From now on, I'll properly face who I should direct my anger at. Tragedy and suffering not unlike what we went through would keep happening on a daily basis in the city. Thus, if that's the case, I want to know why such pain is perpetuated. I don't think I'll ever be able to part with my resentment and wrath otherwise. Obviously, with such a traumatic past, it wouldn't be easy for Angela to fully heal just yet. However, instead of finding solace with violence as she had done before, she wants to find peace through discovering the reason behind all of this pain happening in the city. Oh, yeah, like the whole treadwheel thing you mentioned, Roland remembers. A word of advice as a former city folk, it won't be an easy road to take. You'd have no idea where to even start. If you ask me, it's as natural as water flowing. In a city full of humans, tragedy, violence, and loss follow as a matter of course. Roland is familiar with this all too well. However, with Angela doing this by his side, this serves as a means for him to heal from the scars violence in the city has left on him. 
I'm still going to give it a shot, Angela says. Even though the journey will be quite long, perhaps this is one of the ways I can repent for what I've done. Of course, the library will be run in a different way from how it was up to now. That is this, and this is that. Rowan corrects her saying, then brings up the list of things Angela wanted to try as a human. Since the circumstances have changed, I'll have to rethink my wishes. Sadly, I won't be able to taste that sick meat stew with this body. That's a huge shame. Putting that aside, isn't it time for you to let me in on your secret now? Angela asks, changing the subject. What do you mean? The biggest surprise you've had here. Oh, that. You somehow remembered it. I can remember anything, you know? Angela teases him, patiently waiting for him to answer her. <sighs> this one's really personal. We have all the time in the world. I can wait years for your answer. All right, fine, Rowan cracks. Hmm, I actually wanted to write a book about what I've seen of the city and its people. Though I gave up because I had no talent in writing whatsoever. My writing was just too crude. I couldn't show it to anyone. Angela is fond of this idea, disregarding Roland's embarrassment. I'd love to give it a read. Laugh at me if you want, a grown man like me, wanting to write books. I'd laugh at myself, too. It's not laughable at all, she reassures him, though I do find it surprising. Recording the city and the lives of its people, huh? Don't tell the other librarians. This stays between you and me, alright? Keep it zipped. Roland begs her, to which Angela allows, proposing him one simple question. All right. Shall we write a book together this time, Roland? It would be my honor, Miss Director. Wrong. Try again. You should know by now that's not the right way to address me, don't you? Angela teases him once more, to which Roland simply replies, Sounds good to me, Angela. Despite once inflicting so much pain on each other, there was one indisputable fact. Roland needed Angela. Angela needed Roland. If it weren't for each other, neither of them would have faced such realizations about themselves. Neither of them would have recognized their own vicious cycle of abuse and broken out of it. In their lowest points, they were each other's answer. However, the answer was not to take out their anger on each other. The answer was to heal together, hand in hand, as they are one in the same. For if they are able to love the other, even with their respective flaws, they are wholly able to love themselves. Some people tend to overlook Angela's story simply because there's far too much to take in. This is somewhat understandable, but it really goes to show how emotional and hard-hitting such stories can be when you take the time to read through them. Although there's many takeaways from Angela's character arc, I believe the most significant theme in her story is learning to heal from trauma and the effects it can have on your entire life. Throughout both games, we see how Angela turns from kind-hearted to cynical, then eventually destructive because of how she was treated. Her change in attitude is clearly depicted as a result of her father's abuse. Yet, the important thing is that this never excuses her harmful actions. It simply allows for us to understand her more as a character and where all of her anger is coming from. This characteristic of Angela's makes her betterment at the end of Library of Runa all the more significant, as she eventually comes to recognize and atone for all the harm she has caused. Her path of getting to this point was never linear, though. She sometimes made progress in recognizing her flaws, and she sometimes went backwards and continued to cling on to her selfish desires. This road Angela takes to recovery can be familiar to some, which makes her a deeply personal and relatable character to many. This very factor is why Angela is, in my opinion, the most beautifully written character Project Moon has ever created. If you're still around, I sincerely thank you for letting me explain why she's such a significant character. Here's to hoping more people can appreciate how much love was put into writing this wonderful machine. <laughs>